Okay, we are set. I'm going to call the meeting to order at 2.01. So, members of the public are invited to participate in this meeting of council by accessing the meeting, which will be live streamed on our Middlesex Centre YouTube channel or by contacting the Municipal Clerk to receive a registration link to join the meeting electronically. Members of the public may also attend the meeting in person at the Elderton Community Centre located at 13168 Elderton Road in Elderton, Ontario. Uh, there are no additions to the agenda. I'll look for disclosures of pecuniary interest. Seeing no conflicts then, um, we can move on to item 4.1. Uh, John Mascarin of Eric's Bayless, Integrity Commissioner and Close Meeting Investigator for the Municipality of Middlesex Centre, will be in attendance to provide an education and training session regarding the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, as well as open and closed meetings. Um, the, oh. So that's our motion, right. So I see Mr. Mascarin is here. Hello, welcome. And um, I'm going to turn the meeting over to you and uh, we're ready to take notes, I guess. That's the way it goes, right? The floor is yours, sir, when you're ready. Uh, thank it's you. Time. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, hello, members of council. Thank you very much for having me uh, back again. I was here two weeks we're ago. Wait a minute, John, just one second. Sure. Uh, we're looking at the wiring. <laughs> thank you. Pardon? Let's try again. Still nothing. I'm sorry, you can't hear me? No, you can't hear me. Okay. If it doesn't say one moment, please. <laughs> Okay. Would you just call for a brief two minute recess? Okay, let's take a two minute recess so we can uh, just work on that without worrying about noise and things. Okay, we'll be right back. Okay, we're going to try again. Hello? Madam Mayor, can you hear me now? We can. This one. Yep, okay. So, so, so I'm going to call the meeting back to order and we'll start our training session. The floor is yours, sir. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of council. Thank you very much for having me back again. I have a special guest with me, uh, one of our articling students, uh, Jonathan Maroon Batista, is with me. I asked if uh, he could attend. Uh, Jonathan uh, summered with uh, our firm, and he is an articling student right now and has a keen interest in municipal law. So I hope you don't mind. I know uh, it's an open session today, and uh, I hope you don't mind that he's joining us. He's going to learn lots today. Not at all. Our pleasure, and uh, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, I was here two weeks ago, and I presented, I was supposed to present on uh, codes of conduct, the role of the Integrity Commissioner, and the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. We only got through the first two. So today, I'm going to start, and I'm going to talk to you about the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Now, your uh, CAO has alerted me that there was a there was a question last time, and it's something that I hadn't covered off in my original presentation to you dealing with codes of conduct and the integrity commissioner. But I will cover it off in this particular uh, session. Now I had in, in, envisaged that the two sessions would go back to back, but the question was very good, which was what happens when a member is under investigation and the report comes to council. Is the member entitled to participate? Is the member entitled to make submissions? Is the member entitled to vote? And interestingly enough, the answer is found in the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, which is probably not where you would think the answer would be found, but there's a reason and it's historical and I will get to it. So I will answer the question uh, if you let me get through my materials. And again, Madam Mayor, I'm pleased to get questions uh, anytime that anyone would like to ask a question. And if you'd like to wait till the end, that's fine too. So I'm gonna today talk firstly about the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and then um, I'm hoping maybe a, a very short break, and then I'll speak about the open meeting rule and its exceptions here in Ontario. So uh, I'm going to now share my screen and I'm going to put up the uh, presentation dealing with uh, dealing with the uh, sorry I'm just having some technical difficulties pulling up my screen here just bear with me Please let me know if you have my PowerPoint presentation up on your screen. It says that it's it's loading right now. We don't see it just yet. Okay. I have a message that says your screen share is loading. So hopefully it'll, if not, I'll, I'll stop share and, and try it again. I'm going to stop sharing and try again. So here, here we go. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, it's not letting me stop share. Do I have the permission to share, by the way? Uh, the okay. clerk says you should have that. Okay, I'm going to try it again. Maybe I just went a little too fast. I'm going to see if I can. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. It yeah, it's all good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so, uh, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, a very important piece of legislation. Here's a little bit of background and purpose. Uh, the original statute was created, uh, was enacted in 1972. It codifies provisions, believe it or not, that go back to the original Baldwin Act in 1849. I haven't traced it that back far, but uh, I've been told that. It's received an incredible amount of judicial consideration for such a short statute. It's only 15 sections. And yet there are hundreds of cases that have been decided on the statute. It applies to members of council and members of local boards. It does not apply to administrative staff. Many members of the public get confused with this, and they think that municipal staff are also subject to the MCIA, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and they are not. It only applies to members of council or members of local boards. The best thing that I can tell you about the purpose of the statute is in this quote from one of the earlier uh, seminal cases, Mole versus Fisher, that said this, the obvious purpose of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act is to prohibit members of councils and local boards from engaging in the decision-making process in respect to matters in which they have a personal economic interest. 
Well said. It's members cannot participate and uh, um, have a role in the decision-making process when their personal economic interest is impacted. And you'll find that personal economic interest is actually quite expansive. It's not quite as narrow as that quote would lead you to believe. It was an interesting case just last year. The London District uh, Catholic uh, School Board uh, said... Uh, in that case, there was an argument by one of the members saying, wow, this act is so prohibitive. It is so all encompassing. It won't let us as school board trustees do our job. And the court completely disclaimed this at paragraph uh, 33. The court said, I do not accept that the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act was designed to paralyze local governance intentionally or inadvertently. In fact, the MCIA was specifically designed to attempt to balance effective governance with integrity and accountability. That is a really great statement. And I get met with this all the time. Well, if I can't make decisions like this, uh, my hands are completely tied and I can't do my job. And as I said, the court has completely disclaimed that. And I'll show you where this comes into play very, um, very effectively in the principles that have been articulated under the statute. So you all know that before you become a member of council, you have to swear an oath of office, a declaration of office under Section 232 of the Municipal Act. Here's what the third declaration actually says that you will do, that you will disclose any pecuniary interest, direct or indirect, in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. So you've sworn a statutory declaration in order to take your seat as members of council saying that you will abide by the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act by disclosing pecuniary interest. Now, that's a personal obligation. If you didn't know, you're swearing an oath. You're personally getting someone to commission that and you're swearing, promising, making solemn declarations that you will do that. The obligation of every member is to abide by the MCIA and it's personal in nature. The case of Cooper versus Wianco from Georgian Bay said, the decision to exercise the obligations set out in section five are characterized as a matter of personal judgment of each counselor. Okay, that, that means you cannot turn to someone else and say, well, why didn't you tell me? Uh, CAO, you're a very knowledgeable, experienced CAO. Why didn't you tell me I had a conflict of interest? Clerk, you're the person who administered the oath. Why didn't you tell me I had a pecuniary interest that I had to declare? It's not their job. It's not the job of anybody else except the member to make a decision and to abide by their personal uh, sw uh, solemnly sworn oath that they will abide by the obligations under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Now, the public won't quite understand the act because they'll look at the title. It says it's the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Now, interestingly enough, the words conflict of interest are only used twice, once in the title and once buried in, I think, section 14 of the act where you wouldn't even think it applies. So the public thinks that a conflict of interest is this. And I just I think I've taken this from a common dictionary. I'm not sure which one, probably Collins. The common meaning of a conflict of interest is a situation in which a person has a private or personal interest sufficient to appear to influence the objective exercise of his or her official duties, like, for instance, a public official, an employee, or a professional. That's not exactly what the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act is, is uh, interested in. The meaning there is a conflict is whether you, as a member of council, have a direct an indirect or a deemed pecuniary interest. It is quite scoped in nature. It is not as broad as the public thinks it is. Uh, now, we grapple with this all the time as integrity commissioners because we get a lot of complaints about members and it just doesn't fall within the scope of the act many times what they're looking at. So what you are concerned about under the uh, MCIA is a direct 
an indirect or a deemed pecuniary interest. Now, what constitutes a sufficient pecuniary interest to trigger Section 5 will not necessarily be demarcated by a bright line. Truer words have not been spoken. I had uh, a deputy mayor of a municipality reach out to me last evening saying, John, I've always declared pecuniary interest in the past uh, relating to my husband and his business. Do I need to continue to do so in the future? So my first question was, what did you declare on and what is it that you're being asked to possibly consider in the future? Because I can't give you advice or an opinion in a vacuum. Everything is very fact-driven and fact-specific. What you'll find is the determinations of what is a pecuniary interest and whether a member has complied or not with their obligations under the Act is very, very nuanced and fact-specific. And it really depends on that. So there is no bright line test that I can say to you forever in a day, this applies because uh, the questions are very um, nuanced uh, and they're very, very fact specific. And you'll see that there are a number of exceptions that may apply. So while I might this afternoon give you some general rules, you always have to bear in mind that there are a number of exceptions that may apply in every uh, in any given circumstance. So please bear that in mind. So. I wanted to point out the principles. Uh, so before we talked about, um, you know, the act being uh, working to balance uh, proper decision making with integrity and uh, and accountability, the principles recognize those. There didn't used to be principles in the statute until Justice Cunningham in the Mississauga Judicial Inquiry back in 2011 recommended principles to aid in the interpretation and application of the act. So here are the statutory principles that were put in place by Bill 68 in section 1.1. And I'll save you I'll save you the the reading. The first 3 are essentially paraphrases taken by some of the leading cases. And they talk about things that you would normally think would be commonplace. The importance of integrity, independence, accountability. The importance of certainty in reconciling a public duty with a personal economic interest. Um, the members are expected to perform the duties of office with integrity and impartiality and in a manner that will bear the closest scrutiny by the public. Now, again, those are taken from some of the leading cases, but I want to focus on the fourth principle, this is entirely new, and I think this is really helpful in trying to understand how is the act to be interpreted and applied. The act actually says there is a benefit to municipalities when members have a broad range of knowledge and continue to be active in their own communities, whether it's in a business, in the practice of a profession, in community associations and otherwise. What this principle is telling you is that as a member of council, there is nothing wrong with you having roots in your community, with having connections, with doing other things in your community. That's a good thing. It actually says there is a benefit. So what you just need to do is, what do you do when you have those particular interests? You work in the community, you have uh, run a profession, you run a business. You're involved in some sort of community association. What do you do as a member of council when you're asked to make a decision? That's the question that you need to ask yourself. And I'll show you the question that you have to ask. But this is really important because many people think that just because you may have a conflict, that that's a bad thing. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's recognized by the statute that you could possibly have a conflict. All that the statute asks you to do is to be mindful of it and to respect your obligations and to do what the act tells you to do when you have a pecuniary interest, a financial interest in something. Okay, so 
the whole premise of the act is based on financial interest. It uses the old terminology, pecuniary. I don't know why they didn't modernize it and just call it financial, but they still call it pecuniary. So what is a pecuniary interest? It's essentially something, and the Mondu and Tuchenhagen case from up in Thunder Bay says it quite Clearly, a pecuniary interest is one, quote, concerning or consisting of money, an interest that has monetary or financial value. The case says there are three types of pecuniary interest in the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. There's a direct interest, an indirect interest, and also a deemed interest, okay? And the interest arises in two scenarios. The first one is council or committee meetings okay now that's been in place since 1972 okay however a new amendment which i will call the hazel mccallion amendment and i'll speak to it in just a moment also says you have to be careful when the matter is not in front of council or committee but it's just with municipal staff for a decision or a recommendation Okay, so it arises in two instances. And uh, the new instance, the second one there, only came in place in 2019 by the Bill 68 amendments. And it really arose from Justice Cunningham's report in the Mississauga Judicial Inquiry. Okay, so I'm going to run through each of the three pecuniary interests direct, indirect, and deemed. And I will tell you that they can be positive in nature in the sense that you might be able to profit from it, or it can be negative in nature in the sense that you might stand to lose a financial economic standing because of some decision that council may need to make. OK, so I'll run through each of them. The first one is the simple one, a direct interest. OK, now Rivet and Bray, which is a companion case to Wyanko, sorry, Cooper and Wyanko, which I just showed to you, says this. The term direct is not defined in the MCIA. However, given the word, it's plain and ordinary meaning. It must refer to a situation in which a member could experience an immediate, non-deviated, or traceable financial or economic impact, positive or negative. Okay? So you could unequivocally yourself stand to benefit or lose from a matter that's before counsel if you have a financial interest. That's a direct interest. That's the easy one. We're going to get a little more complicated now. An indirect interest, and here I quote from the really terrific book called um, Ontario Municipal uh, uh, Conflict of Interest Act, a Handbook by uh, Rick O'Connor and David White. This is a really terrific book. I keep it on my desk because I refer to it almost daily. They say Section 2 of the Act, which creates indirect pecuniary interest, attributes to every member as an indirect pecuniary interest, the pecuniary interest in a matter that's held by every described corporation, body, partner, or employer with which the member has a relationship as it's described in the section. Okay, now that's what their interpretation is. I'm now gonna break it down for you. An indirect interest is where a member is a director or a senior officer of a public or private company, is a shareholder of a private company, has a controlling interest in a public company, or where the member is a member of another body. Okay? If any of those entities, bodies, corporations have a financial interest, the interest of the corporation, the body, is imputed to the member. Okay? The last two. If the interest is of a member's partner or of a member's employer, then the interest of the partnership and the interest of the employer is attributed to the member, okay? That is what an indirect interest is. The act isn't really interested in whether you may personally 
financially benefit. The purpose of the indirect interest provisions is to cover off perceived or apparent conflicts. So I'll give you an example. If a member of council is employed by their employer and their employer comes before council seeking something, an approval, a grant, an exemption, something that might be of economic value to the employer. Most persons would look at that and go, well, hold on, the council member is employed by that entity who's coming before council. The member might be more likely to be predisposed to do something that might favor that particular entity, that particular employer. That's what this section is meant to capture, okay? It, I have this many times. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a director of this corporation, but the fact that it may get a financial benefit doesn't mean it flows down to me. I don't get anything out of it. Or I'm an employee. Because my employer may get some benefit out of council's decision and may be awarded a contract doesn't mean that my job is more secure or that I will get a bonus or, 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 or an increase in pay. The cases are not concerned with those things. And the act is, the act basically is trying to cover off if you have a connection, if you have a relationship, if there's a nexus between you and any of these entities set out in section two, then it's an indirect interest that you have to be mindful of and you have to recuse yourself, okay? Now, the one that's really difficult for some people to understand, and I will try to break this down as best I can, is the fourth sub-bullet. The one that says where a member is a member of a body, Okay, body is not defined in the act, but we have some guidance by the case that I've put there. It's a case from the Ontario Court of Appeal. And the case says it's not a defined term, but it should be given its broadest possible interpretation to capture all possible conflicts of interest. So it's a very broad determination. So what is a body? Well, I can tell you, a body has been determined to be things like um, a community association, a lake association, a ratepayer group, a charitable organization, a nonprofit corporation, uh, a service club, a place of worship. It's pretty broad. And why? Because it seeks to cover off those apparent uh, perceived conflicts that someone would have if they're somehow connected, associated, in, in partnership with, or employed by any of these particular entities. So let me be really clear. It doesn't really matter whether you as a member of council can somehow profit or benefit from it. If there's some financial benefit or possible non-loss of economic value or economic standing by one of these entities, and you are a member or you're somehow associated with these entities, you have to step away because that's an indirect interest under the Act. This is the one that trips up most council members, okay? Again, happy to take any questions on this if you have any after. Deemed interest. This is the third type. I've put up. Oh, sorry. Did you have a question? We do have brown hand. I see hands. Um, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor to John. Um, if I own a farm and there's a drainage works going on, and I have to pay a portion of that, and I am I exempt from the drainage act? Is there something in the drainage act that says I don't have to? Do, uh, Declare a conflict on that situation? Yeah, I'm Councillor Brennan, my apologies. Uh you're not coming through as clearly as I as I like. It's probably my 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 here, but could you just repeat the question? Yeah. Um under the Green Jack, it says you are exempt from conflict of interest. So if I own a farm and there's drainage works going on and draining through my farm and I'm assessed 
uh, a certain amount of money for the, the work being done on the green, do I, do I not have to declare a conflict on that? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Council Brother. I appreciate you. Uh, you uh, you have a specific exemption that applies in that particular case. There's uh, an exemption in Section Four. I think one of my next sections, uh, one of my next parts of this, we'll talk about the, the exemptions, and you'll see that drainage and farmlands both come up in that. So you will have a specific exemption. It recognizes that you might have a pecuniary interest. But it says, even if you do, you're okay, because there's a specific exemption that applies. So that's how I would answer that question. Okay. I'll move on to deemed interest. So this is the third type of interest. I put up the full quote for you. Uh, it says, for the purposes of this act, the pecuniary interest, whether it's direct or indirect, of a parent or the spouse or of any child of the member shall, if known to the member, be deemed to be the, also the pecuniary interest of the member. So this says that if your spouse, which could be same sex, common law, your child, which could be a minor or an adult, or your parent, if they have a direct interest in something before counsel, or even an indirect interest because of one of their connections to one of those bodies set out in section two, if you know about it, you're deemed to have the same interest. And by the way, you can't have willful blindness. Sometimes the courts will say you ought to have known. So you didn't necessarily you know, know exactly, but you ought to have known and you should have made some efforts to, to understand. So just think of how broad this is. If your spouse, for instance, just taking this, if your spouse is employed by the entity that's coming before counsel seeking an exemption to a bylaw for a certain reason. And there might be some economic value to that exemption because it could, you know, uh, go to the profit of that entity. Then your spouse has an indirect interest and that interest is deemed to be yours under section three. So you have to be really careful with these. So we've got direct, indirect, and deemed interests. Okay. Now, as Councillor Brennan's example brought up, there are some exceptions, and I will double back on this because I do want to talk to you about an exception to the uh, to the body one when you're a member of a body, and I'll get to that in just just a moment. But I wanted to highlight that for you. Okay, so what? Duties do you then have if you have any of these pecuniary interests? Well, the duties are set out, firstly, in Section 5.1 of the Act. Where a member has a pecuniary interest in any matter that's before counsel and is present at the meeting at which the matter is under consideration, the member shall do these things. The first one is positive in nature and the last two are negative. The first one is you have to disclose the pecuniary interest. Uh, probably the second or third thing on your agenda for every meeting is declarations of pecuniary interest. So if you have a pecuniary interest, which is uh, direct, indirect, or deemed, you have to disclose it. That's the positive obligation. Then what do you do? You cannot participate and you cannot vote in the matter. And secondly, you cannot attempt to influence the voting in any way. That is your duty. That's been in place essentially since the 1972 statute in section three of that former statute. The second obligation that you have is the new one. This is what I called the Hazel McCallion Amendment, which was put in place specifically at the recommendation of Justice Cunningham in the Mississauga Judicial Inquiry. This is the one that says, just because you're not at a council meeting does not mean that you can't have influence. So you have to be very careful. This says that where a member has a pecuniary interest in any matter that is being considered by an officer or employee of the municipality, the member can't use their office to influence the recommendation or the decision that may emanate from the CAO, the clerk, the director of planning, your treasurer, your chief building official. You cannot do that. 
Okay, this was put in place because in the Mississauga Judicial Inquiry, which dealt with conflicts of interest, Hazel McCallion said any time that my son's matter was possibly in front of counsel, I always declared a pecuniary interest in any committee or council meeting. And Justice Cunningham said, that's fine, Mayor McCallum. You did do that, but you forgot that you were doing all of these things behind the scenes and you were pushing everyone's button and twisting everybody's arm to do certain things. You just can't do that because you're the mayor of the municipality. You always bring that status when you're meeting with staff or officers of the municipality. Okay, so I've been asked, can't we even talk to staff? I don't think that's what this is saying. What it says, though, is you can't walk into staff's office and start, you know, letting them know that you're the council member and you have some concerns or you have an interest in something that they're looking at if you have a pecuniary interest because you may be using the influence of your office to get something done before it gets to council, before it gets to a committee because either the officer or the employee has a delegated authority or administrative authority to do something, or they're making a recommendation that may go to council. Okay. So please be careful. By the way, there are no cases decided on this particular point. That's because I think staff have been very hesitant and very trepidatious of going forward and claiming that a council member improperly use their influence on them. I predict that in the next five years, you're probably going to see a court case based on Section 5.2, this new section. OK, so please be careful of that when you're speaking to staff about any matter, just because you may not seek to infer sorry, imply any kind of status of office staff may infer that that's what you're actually doing in uh, possibly meeting and asking questions. Okay, so please, please be mindful of this. Here's your self-assessment with respect to pecuniary interest. And again, I quote from O'Connor and White's book. The question is, do I or any party whose interest I am deemed to have stand to gain or lose arising out of the vote in question? Or does the vote have the potential to affect my financial position, notwithstanding how it goes? Okay. If the answer is yes to that question, then you need to comply with the obligations under Section 5, which is do not participate, disclose your interests, and don't attempt to influence the voting, and don't attempt to use the influence of your office to influence any decision or recommendation from staff, all right? Here are the exceptions. So I've given you the main rules. I'm now going to show you the 11 exceptions that are set out in Section 4 of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. And I'm finally going to answer that probing question from last council meeting that I didn't get to when I talk about uh, Section 5, point, uh, 5 sub 2.1. Okay, so here are the 11 exceptions. I'm going to show you the first uh, five of them. These are all set out in Section 4. The exceptions apply when a member has a pecuniary interest. Okay, so if you have a pecuniary interest, you may be accepted or exempted from the application of Section 5, 5.2, and 5.3 of the statute. OK, now I didn't talk about Section 5.3 because that section only deals with the authority uh, and the obligations of a mayor in a strong mayor municipality. And Middlesex Center has not been uh, designated as a strong mayor municipality. So I've skipped that. 
Okay, so here are the first five. These are very specific, and you'll see that they do talk about in uh, clause E uh, an interest in property affected by drainage works, which is what Councillor Brennan had been asking about, right? Uh, so these are all very specific. You'll see that the next four are also quite specific, and then the last two are general. So here's the next four. Interest in farmlands. I think Councillor Brennan's question also went to that. Uh, and then there are uh, three more. And then at the end, you'll see that there's the two general ones, an interest in common with electors generally and a remote or insignificant interest. OK, the last two are the two that have engendered the greatest number of court cases, because every time a member has a court application brought under the act, they seem to argue, well, it's an interest in common or there's a remote or insignificant interest. And I'll explain those a little bit more. You'll, the first nine of them have been termed by O'Connor and White in their book to be, one, self-explanatory and two, commonsensical. But I'll tell you, I once went to court on clause I there, that's the one that says any allowance, remuneration, salary or benefit that a member may be entitled to by reason of being a member. OK, and I once went to court on this and the judge, who was quite astute, said, well, Mr. Mascaret, when I've dealt with these cases before, there seem to be a lot of reference to cases and I don't see in your materials reference to any cases that have considered this. Why is that? And I said, well, Your Honor, in fact, not only did we search Ontario, but we searched every jurisdiction in Canada that has a similar statute or similar part in the statute, like the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. And there's been no substantive discussion on what the exception is for any allowance, remuneration, salary, or benefit. And I said, however, the case, uh, the, the leading authors have said that these are commonsensical and self-explanatory. So he said to me, well, Mr. Muscarin, you have an hour and a half to tell me how commonsensical and self-explanatory it, uh, it is. And, do you know, I took an hour and a half and my friend on the other side, that's what opposing counsel call one another, who really is not my friend, uh, took an hour and a half to explain why I was wrong. Look at Look at I, any allowance, remuneration, salary, or benefit that a member may be entitled to. This says you are entitled to set your own compensation. You're entitled to determine for yourselves what benefits you may receive, whether they're health, retirement, uh, expenses that may be paid by the municipality for conference attendance, or mileage, or whatever. You're allowed to set those. Otherwise, who would set them, right? Now, the argument in the case that went forward was the benefit was only applicable to that one member. And the argument that my friend put forward is this was only meant to apply in general. It could not apply to anything specific. So could it? Uh, how, how do you determine it? So I argued that there was no, uh, no words that limited the applicability. It says, first of all, any benefit that a member may be entitled to by virtue of being a member. It didn't say that the member was entitled to it, may be entitled to it. And it said any benefit, which was very broad. The happy news is, at the end of the day, the court agreed with my interpretation. So, but it took a while. So just to show you how complex this may be. Now, I want to round back up to something I said before. So when I'm doing training, please understand that I'm giving you training in a general way here. But there always could be an exception that applies and other factual circumstances. So I said to you before, and I showed you the indirect interest provisions. And again, I'm going to go down to the fourth bullet is a member of a body. And we all know, because I told you, that body is to be given a broad interpretation. So I said to you, if you're a member of community association, a service club, a place of worship, a nonprofit, a charitable organization. If you're a member of any of those, then you have to be careful. If they come in front of council, 
you have a pecuniary interest, you have to disclose it, recuse yourself, okay? However, there is an exception. So I'm going to go back down now to the exceptions, and I'm going to point you to H. You are a director or a senior officer of a municipal corporation, or you've been appointed by council to a board, commission, or other body. Now, this is not unusual. Council members often sit on other bodies. The conservation authority is the one that always comes to mind, right? There may be others. You may be appointed to the committee of adjustment. You may be appointed to the property standards committee, the licensing committee, um, uh, any other ones, right? If you are appointed by council to be on the board of the directors of a municipal corporation, or you've been appointed to a board commission, tribunal, or other body by council, then you do not have to worry about the indirect interest implications of Section 2. You're entitled, even though you may be a member of that other body, when the thing comes to council for consideration, you are allowed as a member of council to continue to vote on it, even though you wear another hat and you're also a member potentially of the conservation authority. That's an exception that applies. This is misunderstood by many council members who say, oh, I'm a member of the conservation authority and we decided on rates and now it's coming to council. I need to recuse myself. You don't because a specific exemption applies. Here's my takeaway from this. Some of these are complex, and some of these are almost counterintuitive. So please, you can reach out to us, and you can get advice from us as integrity commissioners if you're at all uncertain as to the applicability of this. Now, I'm hoping today's uh, training will help you, so you don't have to necessarily reach out to us. But I, I can tell you that some of these are complex. And I do want to talk about the last two exemptions uh, exceptions that I've noted in red there, because those are the ones that, um, again, find their way in court decisions uh, more often than you think. So the first one, the exception for an interest in common with electors generally. And I bet if you haven't heard me speak about this before, you would probably say, John, that means I have to have the same interest as every other elector throughout the whole entire municipality. And the answer is actually no. Why? Because the term is defined in Section 1, and it actually says it can mean every other person in the municipality. For instance, tax rates that are set for every person in the municipality that owns residential, commercial, industrial, manufacturing, whatever, institutional property, right? Okay. But if the matter under consideration affects only part of an area, then that could constitute the interest in common with electors. So my takeaway is this could be a much smaller area than you would normally think. It doesn't mean every person in the municipality. The exception can apply to a class or an order of electors. And there's a recent case, Patry versus uh, Elliot Lake, that quotes from an earlier case that said the breadth of those who share the interest defines whether Section 4J of the MCIA applies. So it's not necessarily just the interest. It's the breadth of those people who share the interest, which determines whether this um, uh, exception applies. So the pecuniary interest in common, the question often comes down to, is it the same as the order or class of other electors? The question often comes down to, is there a similarity or a difference in nature, or is it the difference or similarity only in degree? Let me give you an example. You have a road. There is a... a uh, an item before council where the the council is considering awarding a contract to improve a stretch of road. Let's say the stretch of road is two kilometers. And let's say the stretch of road is primarily residential in an urbanized area. Okay? 
and you want to improve it. You want to have a modern uh, uh, streetscape. You want to have underground services, all of these things, right? And you own a property on the street, a two-kilometer stretch. And let's say there's 100 properties. I'm just making this up. 100 properties. Is that a large enough area? Right? It's the breadth of the people who are covered by that area. My view, 100 people, properties, yeah, I think you're covered. Okay? Now, change the facts a little bit. Still, same two-kilometer stretch of property, 100 properties, but you're the only property that's a commercially zoned property. Every other property there is zoned for residential use. Difference in nature, difference in degree. Difference in nature, the nature has changed there. Change the facts one more time. I'm hoping these illustrations help you out. Same two kilometer stretch of road, okay? You have 100 properties, but only one property has a large frontage. Let's say it's double the size of every other property there. They're all residential properties, right? But you can, you can see why I'm doing this. The person with the larger frontage may possibly bear a larger assessment. Is that a difference in nature or is that a difference in degree? I'll tell you, the difference there is in degree. It's the same basis, same residential properties, except that one is just slightly different. It could have been, I could have said, it's just one third larger, one tenth larger, uh, one quarter smaller, but it's still the same nature and kind. The question there, because of the larger frontage, it's only a difference of degree. Now, here's what I'm gonna say. Even these things boggle our minds when we're dealing with it. So I can imagine what it might do for you trying to decipher all of this uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. The good thing is you can reach out to us and we can help you with these questions. So that is an interest in common with electors. It doesn't mean every elector in the municipality could mean a much smaller area. Okay, the question often comes down to how small is the area? So I'll give you one example. Uh, five, six years ago, I gave an opinion to a member of council. She said, John, I live next door to this golf course that's seeking a, a, a zoning change, which will dramatically impact what's happening there for my adult retirement community next door. And I said, how many people? She said, 1,400. I go, I think that's a large enough area that it encompasses an area in common with electors generally. And the court actually agreed because the matter went ahead and went to court and the court agreed with my assessment. What happens if there's an area, and go back to my road improvement area, but there had only been three properties, four properties on that. They were all large properties on the road. And a member of council owned the property in one of them. Would that have been an interesting problem with electors generally? I think the case is, and there's a case called Innismore. It says you can't go down only two properties. And then it becomes a question of a determination whether the breadth of the electorate, the people who are covered by it, is broad enough, is large enough. And in my situation, I'm telling you, if I had been asked that question, there was only four properties six properties on the stretch of uh, two kilometers, I would say not a large enough uh, significant number of electors to cover that, okay? That's why it's important to perhaps seek the integrity commissioner's advice on these questions, okay? So that's the first general exception. I'm gonna go to the second one. There's an exception for remote or insignificant interest, okay? And the best thing that I can show you is quoting from Whiteley and Schnur, a case that came um, right after Jaffeen and Mortson in 1999 that hadn't put in a very good test. And the court recognized this. And the court came up with this test. Would a reasonable elector, being apprised of all of the circumstances, be more likely than not to regard the interest of the counselor as uh, likely to influence the counselor's action and decision on the question. That is an excellent way of putting it. So 
first of all, it's a reasonable elector. It's not someone who's being unreasonable, who's being totally subjective. You're going to the impartial, objective, neutral, reasonable person who is looking at all of the facts, not just the cherry picked item. It's considering all of the circumstances. So I think this is a really great test. Now, they use the words remote or insignificant. Do they mean different things? And yes, they do. Remoteness relates to the immediacy and potential of the financial or economic interest. Okay. The case that I've cited there, Darcy and Mino, the dollar amount at stake there was only $300. And yet the court said, it doesn't really matter what the amount is. What matters is, would you get it? Is Was it a potential or was there an immediacy, uh, a real potential that you would get it? If there is, then remoteness does not apply. Significance does not relate to the dollar amount. This is what Rob Ford, the former mayor of Toronto, attempted to argue in this case, Magger and Ford, an infamous case that went forward. The court said, no, 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 significance relates to the importance of the matter to the member. And in that case, Rob Ford was asked to pay $3,150 back that he improperly solicited from people who were doing business with the city of Toronto. The integrity commissioner said, you have to pay that back. And he said, well, this is pure insignificance to me, Your Honor, because I'm uh, I, I'm a millionaire. What's $3,150? And Justice Hacklin had a great remark. He said, well, Mr. Ford, he said $3,150 is a significant sum of money for any person in the province of Ontario. But that's not the key. The key here is I saw you make an impassioned plea to counsel where you spoke for two and a half minutes on a prepared speech. He said, I think this matter was of significance to you because it was important. And therefore, you don't fall within this exception. So very interesting cases. So those are the exceptions. So I, uh, I, want, to, I want to tell you about something that happened in, uh, in a municipality. So I was giving this lecture and I went through and talked about the indirect interests. Um, and then uh, I think one council member took me at heart because I said to him, if you're a member of a body, you need to step away and not make a decision. And he thought, ah, this is a gotcha because the mayor, in my case, did participate, did uh, vote on the matter, and she was a member of this uh, of this body. Well, what I didn't factor in, of course, when I'm saying these things to you is that an exception could apply, just like Councillor Brennan brought up earlier. And I wouldn't have known that. So... That member was very angry at me when he filed um, an MCIA application against the mayor. And then it came back that there was no contravention. While there was a pecuniary interest, the member was accepted. And the member was livid at me. And I said, well, but I'm going to be giving you general advice. All of these determinations are made in the specific. And so that is why it's important that you may be able to reach out to the integrity commissioner for advice. So the next thing that I want to show you is showing you all the full exemptions. I want to show you one of the partial exemptions. And this will answer the question that was pending from last term. The question was, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Councillor Cates, Cates, you asked the question about, I believe, Councillor Stevens in London. Um, and But I don't know that I fully answered the question. I think the, uh, the question that uh, your CAO brought to me is, John, what happens when a member is under investigation and there's a report that comes out and the report may find that they're in contra mention are they allowed to address counsel are they allowed to speak to the matter and the answer is yes okay and the reason is there's a partial exemption so this i call the rob ford amendment because many people criticized that case from going forward saying well hold on counsel was acting as an adjudicative body ask being asked to impose a potential penalty on former mayor ford our principle of law, our system of law says that you're entitled to uh, bring forward and defend yourself in front of the body that um, that is possibly deciding on a penalty. And the courts 
at the lower level and at the visual court both said that's true. However, we cannot read in an exception into Section 4. It's just not there. If there had been something general, we might have been able to interpret it in a certain way. But there was nothing that spoke to this. Well, now there is. But it's only a partial exemption, and I want to, I want to enforce that. Section 5, 2.1 says, where a matter under consideration at a meeting is whether to suspend the remuneration paid to a member for the contravention of the code of conduct, right? Because one of the penalties that can be recommended and that council can impose on a member for breaching the code of conduct is a monetary penalty, a suspension of pay for up to 90 days, okay? That's a financial interest, right? You are allowed to make submissions on the matter, I always advocate for the member being able to do this. This is part of procedural fairness. You can participate in the discussion. You can attempt to influence the other members of council by saying you shouldn't impose that. I don't agree with the recommendations. They're too harsh. They're unwarranted. You can do that. The one thing that you cannot do is you cannot vote on the matter. And there's been a member of council that has been removed from council for having done just that, for having voted on a matter in which she knew full well that she could not vote on. She could speak to it. She could influence the other members of council. She could participate in the discussion. She just couldn't vote. And yet she did. And the court removed her from office. So that is the Rob Ford Amendment to the Act, and it's only a partial exemption. The reason why it's partial is because while you can participate and uh, make submissions and influence, you cannot vote. All of the other exceptions that I showed you before in Section 4, you're entitled to vote. Okay? So, disclosure. How does it happen? Well, disclosure arises oh yes madam mayor can i just jump in before we move to the next section i think we do have a couple of questions on this one yeah. uh councillor case thank you through madam mayor i want to um, ask you for clarification uh, when we talk about service clubs so um i just want some definition on uh, pecuniary interest so, for example, um, we have a grant process, and so multiple people apply for a, a grant. And so when it comes to council with the list of who's awarded the, you know, who's potentially awarded the, the this is my example, um, awarded the grants. And so if you're a member of that service club, uh, is that a pecuniary interest? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Katz, it certainly is. And you will not be entitled to vote on the grant to that particular service club, whether yay or nay. Here's the tougher question, though. Can you vote if there's only a, a bundle of $20,000, $40,000 to meet out on grants? Can you vote on other grants because it may impact the decision on the grant to the particular service club. Uh, that's a really interesting question. I've had to grapple with a few of those. And again, I need to look at the very particulars. But to answer your question, which is a really good one, if the service club comes forward and is asking for a grant and you're a member of the service club and it's not because of a council appointment to the service club, then you have an indirect pecuniary interest and you cannot vote on that matter. Thank you. So if the, as you said, it's a bundle of a list of people. And, you know, what if there's multiple members of council that are on multiple service clubs and, and groups that are on that list? Yeah. So this is what, uh, through you, Madam Mayor, this is what's been done, what I've recommended in the past, because that is a very real scenario. There may be, I don't know, a dozen that come forward and you may have members who are 
part who are members of more than one and you may have multiple members who are members of many of them so what you do is you vote individually on each one and i, I appreciate that perhaps Potentially, there could be this, where your your club your is the very last one, and if you meet out all of the other grants, there may be nothing left, and that might go to the prejudice. So, but that would be the only way that you could deal with it. Otherwise, you'd be you'd be stifled, and no member of council could vote on anything there. And I don't think that's a reasonable way of proceeding it. So perhaps the way then it's done, if that situation should come up, is you would come up with some arbitrary decision uh, um, uh, order in how you would deal with uh, the consideration of who gets grants. You might not do it on an alphabetical. You might do it through some sort of uh, lottery system who gets decided first. Therefore, the decisions are made in that way. Uh, it's not full. It's not foolproof. I I understand that, but it seeks to uh, in, instill a a uh, a modicum of uh, of integrity to the process. Thank you. Just to clarify for you, it's not that it's there's a pot and who's going to get it. The grant committee has brought the recommendation, so it's uh, it, it, they're all on there. But basically, it, it's it's a yes or no for uh, do we like this grant pool or not? So it, it's not that there's you know twenty thousand dollars and we have fifty thousand coming forward. Just to clarify. Okay. Thank you. Does the answer change at all relative to that? No, I guess we are okay. As I said, we have a committee. No. Okay, but he has. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, through the chair, even though there's a grant committee, it's still a recommendation that comes before council. So at the end of the day, council is the deciding ultimate factor. So, what, as our integrity commissioner, as John mentions, we just part and parcel the uh, recommendations out for approval. Simple as that. Yeah. Well, just to follow on, it's true. It's, it says that many of us sit on service clubs. And some, you could get an instance where a number of them that we sit on have uh, been approved for a grant. In other words, recommended. So what you're saying is we deal with them individually. And those of us that are a member of that organization just don't vote on it. But you, I don't think we'll ever get, hopefully, a position where, like, all of council is in a contact where nobody can vote on anything. I don't think that's going to happen. But, okay, did I explain that correct, John? That, in fact, when it comes before us and a number of us are members of these organizations, that we just back out and not vote on it. Yes, uh, through through you, Madam Mayor. Yes, that's the way it would uh, it would work. So again, you have ten organizations, and you're you have maybe well, I don't know five or six members of council who are all impacted, but in certain ways with them, you could vote individually on them. You could possibly, and I was going to get to this slide. You can go down to quorum to only two members. So let's say there's two members on council that are not members of any of the clubs or, or entities that are coming forward for grants. You can actually have everyone else back out uh, and declare pecuniary interest. And those two members can still make a decision because you still have quorum under section seven of the statute. Okay, so two, two is the minimum for quorum. You can't be down to one. Obviously, you can't right? go to one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Council, uh, Council Arts has a question as well. Mm hmm. Hello, Madam Mayor John. If we have a uh, something come up on council and you know a counselor it's got a definite conflict of interest it's not a gray area and it's substantial and they don't declare it as a council we can't do anything about it that it's it could if it's a, a close vote it's, it can get disputed so my question is there's nothing we can do but if there's nothing we can do and that member 
should have known better to at least make them pay our entire court costs when it does go through to a court application? Yeah, I, uh, that's a that's a, a great question. So it's um, I showed you a slide earlier. It's um, a personal obligation of every member of council. I've been faced with this many times. I know that person has a pecuniary interest and they can't vote on this. But I, what am I supposed to do? And my answer is, it's their obligation. Um, it, it's their obligation to declare. And if they don't, there could be consequences. Someone could bring an application, and ultimately the person could be removed from council. To your question, though, is what happens if it's a close vote, a four to three vote, for instance, or a five to four vote, right? Um, the There's a section, I was going to get to this right at the end of this, but I'll just skip it later. Section 12 says that decision is not voided. However, council can reconsider that decision. It doesn't have to go through a reconsideration. Council can reconsider and decide whether they want to void that decision because it wouldn't have had a positive outcome. It would have been a tie vote, which might not have been in the affirmative. So that's what Section 12 says. So it's not a void decision simply because someone votes, they ought not to have voted, and then they're determined that they not they shouldn't have voted because they had a pecuniary interest. It's a voidable decision, but not void. That's okay. It says other questions as well. Just a, thank you, three, Madam Mayor. Just a side question. When you've declared a pecuniary interest, are you required to leave the room? I, I We often do here. I just notice sometimes on the news you see stories and they stay there. And not only that, they spoke up and talked too. Yeah. Uh, so through you, Madam Mayor, Councillor Cates, great question. My best practice is you should leave the room and or if you're on video you should at least um, uh, you should at least uh, uh, go off screen uh, I think that's a good practice interestingly enough Ontario is only one of two jurisdictions in all of Canada that doesn't require you to do so it says that you can't attend or you have to leave the setting of the closed meeting uh, if it's a pecuniary interest, but it doesn't say anything about the open meeting. My my best practice is you should leave the meeting because there's a prohibition on influencing and just being at the meeting and maybe looking stern with your arms crossed, tis tisking uh, might be interpreted by someone as uh, an attempt to influence the uh, the voters, uh, the the other members. So I would recommend you do that, but it's not law. It's not required in Ontario unless you're in a closed meeting. I don't see any other hands. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So disclosure, it arises at every meeting. So if you've disclosed a pecuniary interest on a matter that you considered last meeting and it comes up again because it's continued or, or there's another matter relating to that, you have to disclose it again, okay? It arises afresh every time. And just because you're not at the meeting doesn't mean that you don't have to disclose it. You have to disclose it at the next meeting at which you attend, okay? You now have to provide a written statement of disclosure. This is entirely new. It was in the Bill 68 amendments. Here's my best practice to you. If you know you have a pecuniary interest, you know you have to disclose it at the front. You have to declare it. You also have to write a written statement. Why don't you write out the statement ahead of time and then read out that statement when it comes time to disclose it, declare it. That way, the two will be aligned because one of these days, someone's gonna say something different than what they wrote and someone's gonna challenge you. Because why? Well, your clerk has to maintain a registry, not only of each declaration, but also of the statements of disclosure. So it's very easy for someone to find it. And I think in the next little while, someone's gonna look at these and gonna go, that member said this, but that member wrote that. And those two don't go uh, together, okay? so. Be mindful of that. I've spoken about this before. There's now express specific authority. We as integrity commissioners are entitled to give you specific advice as to your obligations, your individual obligations, not just in general, but I can hear 
your specific concerns about a matter, what the what the relationship is, what your business um, arrangements are, so I can give you that advice. It has to be in writing. So when you request the advice, it must be in writing. You have to provide all relevant facts. The request in writing isn't just, hey, John, can I speak to you tomorrow at three o'clock? It's no. Here is the here is the matter. It's coming up at council. Here is the staff report or the link to it. And here's the background facts. And I want to know, do I have a pecuniary interest? Am I accepted under anything? And here are the all of the circumstances. So we are entitled to do that. That is completely confidential unless you would like to disclose it. You consent to its disclosure or you only partly disclose it and we're entitled to disclose the rest of it or one more exception or you've sought our advice and there's an MCIA application. We know you sought our advice. We gave you the advice and you didn't follow it. We're entitled to disclose the fact that you did. And I've actually got that situation, I think, potentially coming up in another municipality. So I'm going to run through the obligations one more time very quickly, okay? I'm just repeating everything that I've said. The member's obligations. One, you need to disclose the type of pecuniary interest, and sufficient facts to provide some context for the general nature of the interest, okay? I'll give you an example. I'm, uh, I declare a pecuniary interest on item 4B of tonight's agenda because my spouse is employed by the applicant uh, in that matter. There you go. And... As you can appreciate, facts can change. So just because you disclose a pecuniary interest at one meeting, facts may change. The example I just gave you, your spouse is employed. What happens if your spouse is no longer employed by that particular entity? The next time, if the same matter comes forward, someone may be paying attention and go, that they disclosed their interest last time. Why didn't they do it again? Aha, I got them. Facts have changed. The spouse may no longer be employed. There's no obligation on the member to now recuse themselves from participating. Okay? No participation, no vote. That is the most obvious one. You cannot attempt to influence the vote in any way before, during, or after the meeting. So here's an interesting fact situation that I was involved with several years ago. Council member says to me, do I have a pecuniary interest? I said, you do. Do I have to declare it? I go, I don't think you do. I think you don't have a pecuniary interest because you have an interest in common with electors generally. And she said, you know what? I don't feel very comfortable with that. I feel that's kind of wishy-washy. Tell you what, I'm still going to declare a pecuniary interest. And I said to her, well, first of all, you shouldn't do that. I've given you the advice. You can't abdicate your responsibilities. And she said, no, I'll feel better if I declare a pecuniary interest. Before the meeting, this is what she did. She went up to two other members of council that she thought were her friends. In fact, they were her frenemies because she told them, look, I'm going to declare a pecuniary interest on this, but I'd like you to support this. Well, I know that they were her frenemies because they told on her and they submitted sworn affidavits that that's what she said. The court said, you know, counselor, what did you understand about influencing the vote? before, during, or after the meeting. You attempted to influence the vote, even though then you declared a pecuniary interest, which, by the way, you didn't have to because your integrity commissioner was correct on the law. You were in an interest in common with other electors. But for that, I would have found you in contravention because you attempted to influence the voting, and then you wanted to look good in front of people by declaring a pecuniary interest. You can't do that. So just be careful. The lesson there is be careful who you talk to about your interests and don't talk to anyone. Uh, this goes to Councillor Kate's question. You have to exit the closed meeting or just not attend the venue of a closed meeting if you have a pecuniary interest. But again, my best practice, you shouldn't attend the open meeting as well. File a written statement and don't attempt to influence employees. Okay? Forum. I've spoken very briefly about this. If members of council sufficient to 
to disqualify themselves, declare a pecuniary interest, you can go down to two members. If you go down to less than two members, the, the council can make an application to the court to get special dispensation from the court to allow the members to continue to vote. I had to do this last term. Eight out of the nine members of my council in the city of Vaughan had pecuniary interest, and they had an offer on the table to settle litigation of $210 million, and they didn't know what to do because they couldn't they couldn't uh, work it. And the quorum only went down to two. So I went to court and actually got them uh, an order from the court to allow them to make decisions uh, with conditions. Now, this goes to the question earlier. I think Councillor Ertz may have brought this up, and I'm sorry if I've got that wrong. But the question was, what happens if someone is in breach of the act? The law was this way for 47 years. If a member did not comply with their obligations. An elector could bring an application to court in front of a judge to have the member penalized. And the penalties could be disqualification from office, removal from office, and restitution, okay? That was the law for 45 years. This has now changed by the Bill 68 amendments. An application to a judge may now be made by an elector like it always was, by a person demonstrably acting in the public interest. What is that? We don't know because there's no definition and there's been no court consideration. A person demonstrably acting in the public interest, in my view, is someone who's like a public interest litigant. They can't have a personal vested interest in the game, but there's someone who's actually bringing it in the public interest. We don't really know what that is. And look at the last one, a municipal integrity commissioner. And I'll get to that in just a moment. The application period is six weeks from the date that a person had a reasonable subjective belief that there was a contravention. They have to bring the application either to the integrity commissioner or to the court. Okay. The onus is on the applicant to satisfy the criteria that they only found out about it within six weeks, if they didn't bring it within six weeks of the occurrence, right? The person has to bring forward evidence to prove that. The ultimate limitation period is six years. So even though someone may find out about it within the last six weeks, but the incident happened over six years ago, then you're out of luck. And that uh, Mayor Hewitt in uh, Haldeman County last term had uh, seven of eight allegations thrown out against them because they were over six years. Now, you can now apply to the integrity commissioner. A person, so an applicant, can be an elector or a person demonstrably acting in the public interest can apply to us to look into it. We can conduct an inquiry. We have to make a decision at the end of 180 days. And upon completion of our inquiry, we have a decision to make. Unlike a code of conduct investigation report where we come to council and we say, council, we have made these findings and here are our recommendations and it's your decision to make. In this case, it's the integrity commissioner's decision. Do we go to court or do we not go to court? And the question is interesting because what happens if we find that the member has contravened the act? Do we have to go to court? The answer is no, you don't. It's the integrity commissioner's decision to make. And there may be valid reasons why the integrity commissioner would not go to court. We made a decision last term not to go to court, even though we found a contravention. We looked at the contravention and we thought, based on those facts, what had happened there, it didn't look, and the state of the law, it didn't appear to us that the court would impose a big penalty. And we said, we're not going to court. Okay. Other integrity commissioners have made that decision, even in the case where they have found a contravention. They made a decision not to go to court. What happens if the integrity commissioner says, I don't think there's a contravention? Can the council say, no, 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 you're going to go to court? The answer is no. Council has no role in this. The decision is the integrity commissioner's decision alone to make. Okay? And all of the costs are 
are paid for by the municipality. This happened to us in Elliott Lake. I say to us, I'm legal counsel to Elliott Lake. The council did not want the integrity commissioner to go to court last term. And the integrity commissioner said, I'm going to court. And the council said, no, we don't want you to go to court. The integrity commissioner still went to court because the integrity commissioner had the jurisdiction, the authority to do that, and all the costs had to be paid by the municipality. Okay, so municipality has no role here in making the decision if the application is brought to the integrity commissioner. Okay, so um, penalties. Why is this act so important? Well, it's important because there is a broad range of penalties, and I've already indicated three of them removal from office, disqualification and payment of restitution. There's also two new penalties that have been put in place by Bill 68, which are a reprimand or suspension of pay for up to 90 days, which is very similar to what you've seen in the uh, code of conduct uh, instance. Only a judge can impose these penalties. A council cannot impose these, okay? And the judge can impose any or all of these penalties. It's now discretionary. What will the judge consider? in making their decision. They'll look at what precautions or measures did the member take? Did they disclose the pecuniary interest and seek the advice and follow that advice of the integrity commissioner? Okay, I bet you be, if you can prove that, there's no court that's gonna find you in contravention. They may say the integrity commissioner made a really bad judgment call here, but it's not your fault, council member. And then C are the two old saving provisions, which is, did you do it by pure inadvertence or did you do it by an honest error in judgment? So pure inadvertence means you didn't turn your mind to the question. You inadvertently blurted out or did something. Okay, air judgment means you did turn your mind to the question, but you just made an honest error and you didn't uh, consider it correctly. Okay, the courts will excuse you if it makes that determination. There's been a number of cases where that's happened. Okay, so I want to talk to you about three recent cases. The three most recent cases that have gone to an integrity commissioner where the integrity commissioner has decided to go to court have resulted in removal of the members from office. Now, let me tell you, this is extraordinary because in the whole history of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act in Ontario for the first 48 years, you could count on maybe two hands the amount of times that local board members and council members had been removed from office. And yet the last three, you've had three cases where the integrity commissioners clearly knew what they were doing because they went to court and the members were actually removed. Full disclosure, we had involvement in the last two cases. In Espinola, Integrity Commissioner versus Van Alstein, we acted on behalf of the Integrity Commissioner. We went to court and got her removed from office. And I was involved in Elliott Lake versus Patry. This is a case where the mayor was removed from office because of actions that he took before he was elected as mayor, as a council member. We were involved in uh, the court case because of municipal issues that had arisen. One was a retroactive bylaw. And the answer is yes, a council can pass a retroactive bylaw if it's not specifically prohibited. And two, the retroactivity is expressed. So I was able to prove that to the court. And uh, two, was the integrity commissioner properly appointed? And the court said, yes, you did not have to have a bylaw that appointed the integrity commissioner. So the takeaway from this is when integrity commissioners do go to court, they've been largely successful in court. What's really fascinating is there's a very recent decision that's just come out uh, maybe about a month ago where the elector decided, I'm not going to go through the integrity commissioner. I'm going to go directly to court. Now, he had his brother represent him, so I guess he got free legal uh, representation. And the court said, we're not removing the member. In fact, there's no contravention. I think integrity commissioners know what they're doing. I'm not sure that electors sometimes know what they're doing.
Uh, I spoke about this. I'm not going to cover it. The cons uh, the consequence of a contravention is it's a voidable decision, but not automatically void. Is there a right of appeal? There is. There is a narrow right to appeal. If a court makes an order, and what kind of order can they make? Any one of these things. A reprimand, suspension of pay, removal from office, disqualification from holding office, and restitution. That's an order. The order will only be made if there is a contravention. So, the appeal right is an appeal from any order. What does that mean? If there's no finding of a contravention by the first court, the matter is finished. There is no right to appeal. So an elector, a person demonstrably acting in the public interest, comes forward, brings an application, and they're not successful, the matter is over. However, if there is an order... That means there's a finding of a contravention, and then the member has an opportunity to appeal. I suppose, I suppose, and it's happened in um, Pierce versus Elliott Lake, where the member uh, appeals, uh, sorry, where the integrity commissioner appeals and says the penalty wasn't stiff enough. Uh, they lost, by the way, in that one. Uh, but this gives the member an opportunity to appeal. And look at this. The divisional court, so it doesn't go to the court of appeal. And then it says the divisional court may give judgment, in which case its decision is final. You cannot go to the court of appeal. It can only go to the divisional court. That's the highest court that you can go to in Ontario. Three times the Ontario Court of Appeal has said, what don't you know about? Final means final. You cannot appeal to the Court of Appeal. My conclusions is, and I'm going to go back to Green and Boren's, a seminal case, each conflict of interest case must largely stand on its own facts. As I told you at the beginning, all of these decisions are very fact-specific, and the decisions are very fact-driven based on this particular nuanced circumstances of each case, okay? So, conclusions, conflict of interest is not generally what the public thinks it is. It's only financial interest, pecuniary interest. There's a positive personal obligation on every member to abide by the obligations under the act and to act accordingly there are a large number of exceptions that might apply including a partial exemption there are significant penalties including removal and disqualification from office there are some saving provisions so even if you breached the court may uh, look at a number of considerations, and I've shown them to you in 9 sub 2, including did you ask the integrity commissioner for advice and follow that advice? And finally, as I said at the beginning, there are many, many cases, and sometimes they're contradictory, which makes it really hard for people to understand that. So, Madam Mayor, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I will ask if anybody has any questions, because uh, I've concluded the MCIA presentation. Okay, I'm looking to Council. I see uh, Council Groves. Yes, just so that I, I understand, I, many of us uh, would probably go to our clerk and say, if I am, Am I in a conflict of interest here? We get advice from the clerk. If it's stated that he thinks we're in a conflict of interest, is what you told us that we should put it in writing and submit it before the council meeting? Is that what you said? Versus yeah. just declaring it? Yeah, here's what I said. Um, you have to declare uh, the matter, uh, your pecuniary interest, before the matter is under consideration. Then you also have to file a written statement of the matter of the uh, pecuniary interest with the clerk at the meeting or as soon as possible thereafter. So my my best practice to you is if you know that you're going to be declaring and you know that you have to file a written statement, why don't you just write it out beforehand? And when it comes time to declare it, read exactly what's in your declaration, uh, your written statement. That way it will align with what you've said and what you've written. And just to follow on what you said is it's perhaps best practice if we do that, declaring a, a conflict of interest to actually leave the meeting. Yeah, okay. So yes. I don't think we've done that. Doing that, oh, yeah. I mean, we put stuff in writing. Oh. Yeah, I know, but okay, all right. 
for the clarification of procedure by now does not mean that the member of council leave a meeting when they declare a conflict of interest. I would take the advice of the guidance and education we're receiving today, which is that it's a best practice. In a closed session, you must leave the meeting. A procedure violent does not mandate that you will leave the meeting. So that's the reason why in the past you may have seen members of council declare a conflict but choose not to leave the meeting. Hey, anyone else on the auctioneer going once, twice, and I think we've exhausted the list of questions. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Muskerin. Great examples and um, well presented. I, th I think we have vignettes of uh, situations in our mind that will help us recall or at least go, wait a minute, maybe I should check with someone to make sure that I do recall properly and get advice. So well, thank you for your time and all the uh, content that you've provided to us. Is there anything else? Yeah. Oh, part two? This is just. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Yeah. This is right. I, I thought you were in with the thing. <laughs> oh, well, sir. I thought we were done. No, that's right. Okay, hold on. We've got to change our pages. Right. Uh, before yours. <laughs> okay. Uh, Madam Mayor, did you want to take a, just a short break uh, while I get my slide deck up and maybe just a bio break for uh, council? Sure. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll take a short break. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll get the slide deck up.
I don't see him yet. Oh, Jonathan's there. Should I just give him a little bit of Okay. So, yeah. No, well, no. Okay, yeah, we'll just hey. sing um, Lil Hugh, Welcome Back. And thank um, you. I'll let you get started with Lynn. Go ahead, Mr. Messman. Okay. Uh, thank you. Madam Mayor, can I ask, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be a pest on this. Can you hear me okay? Because we're having real trouble hearing you. Uh, the audio is very bad, and I'm mostly guessing at the questions. Okay. Uh, we can hear everyone's nodding. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, that's... Uh, that's good. Okay. And I uh, would accept that um, we're going to look at it from our, at our end here just to see if there's any tweaking that we can do or check things out to make sure. So. Okay. Thank you very much. I, 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 yeah, I'm happy to get started and uh, I'll try to do my best with any uh, questions. Uh, I just wanted to, to note that. So um, our second appointment, Madam Mayor, is uh, we're your integrity commissioner, but you're, we're also your open uh, or closed meeting investigator. So uh, this is training uh, and education on the open meeting rule in Ontario and the closed meeting exceptions, essentially. So I've got a lot on this deck. I will try to go through it quickly. And I will be providing uh, uh, your clerk with a resource. A few, couple of years ago, my partner, my colleague and I wrote a long paper, which really um, emanated uh, in, in, this, um, in this presentation today. So we have a lot of the, the real details in, uh, in an article that we had published. And I will provide it to your, your clerk, who I've gotten uh, uh, um, permission from my publisher to uh, to provide it to my clients. So I hope that will be a resource for you because I will go through this rather quickly because uh, there's a lot on this on this slide deck and I just don't think I'm going to be able to get through it all. So hopefully that article will provide a, a good resource that you could go back to. Uh, and the article is pretty recent. I think it was three years ago that we wrote it. So open and closed meetings. So my introduction is here is the open meeting rule in Ontario. Except as provided in this section, all meetings shall be open to the public, section 239. There it is, pretty simple. Notice that there's an inherent exception right in the open meeting rule, except as provided in this section. What does that mean? It means you have to find the exemption within section 239. It's nowhere else. So the rule is council is to meet in an open public forum to conduct its business unless there's a rule that says you, you don't have to do that. Why? Why do you have that? Well, the famous case, the City of London versus RSJ Holdings, where council went in camera to talk about a potential interim control bylaw for two and a half hours, and then came out in a span of eight and a half minutes past 22 bylaws, including the interim control bylaw. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supremes said, the open meeting rule reflects a clear legislative choice for increase transparency and accountability in the decision-making process of local governments. It says the democratic legitimacy of municipal decisions does not spring solely from periodic elections, but also from a process, uh, sorry, decision-making process that is transparent, accessible to the public and mandated by law. Okay. The Ontario Court of Appeal has uh, also weighed in and in Brantford and Montour said the open meeting rule has these two important rationales. Increase public confidence in local government and prevent secrecy in municipal decision making. OK, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, you probably all know there was a recent decision from the Supreme Court of Canada on the premier's um, mandate letters to their ministers, where I think other levels of government are treated a little bit differently than uh, local councillors uh, and councils, where in that case, the uh, premier sending out mandate letters to the ministries, uh, to his ministers, a few days or a few weeks after the forming of the government was found to encompass deliberative secrecy in cabinet decision making. The same thing does not apply 
to municipal um, municipal uh, meetings and decision making in the municipal context. By the way, uh, Jonathan, my student and I are working on a paper uh, commenting on that decision and its possible implications to uh, the Municipal Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act. So stay tuned. So here's an outline of where I propose to go this afternoon on this. I'll talk about the open meeting rule, a little bit about what constitutes a meeting. What is a meeting? There's two criteria for it. What about electronic meetings? They're permitted. What isn't permitted as an electronic meeting? What are the closed meeting exceptions? This is probably the biggest part that I'll spend this afternoon. I'll talk about a little bit of procedural requirements. How do you go into a closed meeting? Well, you have to pass a resolution. What does it have to say? You'll hear about it in a moment. Can you vote in a closed meeting? Yes, you can. Very limited voting. What about record keeping? What about closed meeting investigations? What about reporting out? And at the very end, some common problems and best practices. So that is an outline of what I'll take you through. So the open meeting rule, as I indicated, Section 239, it's a requirement for all meetings of council and local boards, including the committees of either of them. And a committee is... More than 50% of the members of the local board or more than 50% of members of council. That constitutes a committee. If you have less than 50% representation on a committee, then it's not a committee of council, and therefore it is not subject to the open meeting rule. Okay, The open meeting rule came in place about 100 years ago. Before that, the courts said it's a statutory rule. Unless there's a statutory requirement, there is no obligation for councils to meet in an open public forum. So for the first time ever, it was legislated in the Consolidated Municipal Act of 1922. And if you're historians, you will know that that was a statute that brought in a lot of legislative strictures, restrictions, and limitations on what councils could do. This was one of them, an accountability measure for open public meetings. Prior to 1994, however, the meetings were generally closed based on the type of meeting rather than the subject matter of the meeting. And the modern rule that's been modified, but the modern rule was introduced in the 1994 amendment through Section 55 of the then Municipal Act. The current version of the rule was implemented by Bill 68 in 2019. Uh, and it, um, sorry, it came into force on January the 1st, 2018. That's, uh, that's when it was first put in place. The requirement for open meetings in the City of London by the Supreme Court of Canada says the open meeting requirement is there to allow a citizen to observe municipal government in process, to see local democracy in action. The right to observe is distinct and it's separate from a citizen's right to participate in council meetings. There's a very fascinating case from Sogging Shores. Uh, it was released about this time last year. I think it was the 23rd of February. The court said very clearly, there is no absolute and unfettered right of a person to be able to present to council in any way, in any form, in any manner that they wish. The court said on a constitutional charter challenge to the procedure bylaw, the court said the purpose of council meetings is to have effective and efficient local government and meetings. The purpose of a procedure bylaw and possibly any restrictions or limitations is to have effective and efficient meetings. There is an ability for council in its procedure bylaw to put in rules as to how the meeting will run. A council can decide whether there is an open forum or a delegation opportunity. And council can impose restrictions on the right to delegate. Three minutes maximum up to a total of two hours uh, a total for a subject matter that uh, only new matters can be discussed. Uh, you can't, you have to bring forward new information that matters that are in litigation at the municipality cannot be, um, cannot be discussed that 
profane language and proper conduct um, uh, will be instilled. That you can't, uh, sorry, that you can't have profane language, that you must act with decorum and professionalism. These are all things that the court found were appropriate in the procedure by law in Sogging Shores, and that it decided not to accede to Mr. Mann's application to hold these invalid. In fact, one of the fascinating things that uh, Mr. Mann argued is that if council allows delegations and council allows open forums, then the right to meaningful communication, which is a charter subset of the freedom of expression right, it will require members of council to respond to each and every question that's put to them. And the court said, absolutely not. So just remember that the next time that you have members who are coming and delegating or speaking at an open public forum, you do not have to answer questions uh, that they put to you. You can listen to them and you can consider them, but you do not have to answer the questions. They're on the spot or even thereafter. Mm -hmm. The right to meaningful communication does not extend to counsel having to answer every question that's put in front of you. You can understand why that's the law. I found it astounding that this was actually argued by a lawyer in court. But I suppose you try to push the envelope when you can. So meetings. Here is the definition of meeting as found in Section 238 of the Municipal Act. I've underlined the part of the definition of meeting today that used to be in place. The definition of meeting used to say meeting means any regular, special or other meeting of a council or local board or committee of either of them. And stop. That wasn't very good. And many people have commented, including the Ontario Ombudsman, that it was quite circular and basically said meeting means a meeting, which is really terrible. By the way, it's really awful to use the term that you're defining as part of the definition of a term. That's terrible legislative drafting. The courts had said, though, that a meeting proper meeting entails a couple of things. One is a quorum of members being present. Two, that council actually consider and materially advance the business or decision making of the council. Those are very helpful criterions that have been put in A and B of the definition of meeting. And this was put in place by Bill 68. So A, you have to have a quorum a quorum of members who are present. What is quorum? It's defined in Section 237 of the Municipal Act that says a majority of members. As I just spoke to you under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, you can possibly go down to two members if every other member has declared a pecuniary interest and are disqualified from voting. If you're less than two members, Section 7.2 of the Act says that you can go to court and get uh, authorization from court to go down to less than two members or to allow the members who are otherwise disqualified to vote. Okay, uh, And it can do so with, um, with um, uh, conditions. The second requirement is material advancement. I have interpreted the reports and the cases on this material essentially equals significant. So you can replace the word material with significant. Business or decision making, they're both. They're not, it's not the same thing. The province has decided to use the words business or decision making. So it doesn't mean the exact same thing. I have interpreted that, again, through the reports and through the, the court cases, as something that forms a normal matter or issue or question or concern that is typically or narrowly normally considered by the council. It has to be something more than, quote, doing the groundwork to exercise the power of authority, which was the position of Ontario's former ombudsman before Paul Dubé took place. I think the ombudsman was in 
entirely wrong and misconceived of how meetings worked in Ontario. And in fact, to come to his conclusion that doing the groundwork was the necessary criteria, I think the Ontario Ombudsman had relied on extraterritorial decisions when all he had to do was look at the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Ontario Divisional Court in two cases brought by Southern Inc. Southern Inc. versus Hamilton Wentworth and Southern Inc. versus Ottawa. And that was the grounding. The cases, uh, sorry, the legislative drafters have now put in place you have to have a quorum of members present and material advancement. So you can't have a meeting without those. Can you have electronic participation? Well, you can. It's now been put in place. There was a limited electronic participation that was first put in place. But of course, then we had COVID and it was decided, wow, you know, councils must be able to meet. Otherwise, they can't make decisions. And so the um, Municipal Emergency Act allowed councils to put in place um, uh, uh, some virtual electronic meeting uh, provisions that would allow council to make decisions in a virtual context when you couldn't meet uh, in live and in person. And then that was decided that was good. In fact, instead of eradicating or eroding the local democratic process, I think it enhanced democracy by allowing people who wouldn't normally be possibly available to attend council meetings to be able to do so and to observe by watching council meetings and sometimes participating through delegations and open forum if they registered and were on camera virtually to be able to have their say. So you can have that. However, it's permitted as required under your procedure bylaw. What you cannot do, though, and the Ontario Ombudsman and a number of closed meeting investigators have taken the position very clearly that without express statutory authority, members cannot meet by any form of digital, electronic, or virtual means. This means that council members cannot when there's more than a majority of them, which constitutes quorum, meet through Zoom, Teams, FaceTime, Skype, teleconference calls, chat rooms, or even through serial phone calls, messages, emails, and texts. Because why? Those constitute potentially meetings at which there is a quorum of members present. They're present virtually or electronically, digitally, but they're present and they are potentially advancing the business of counsel. You cannot do this. I've cited a number of older cases on point. There are a whole bunch of recent cases on point. So be careful when you are corresponding with other members. If there's more than a majority of members on an email and there is some exchange back and forth, you could be participating in an illegal meeting. Now, people often say to me, our CAO sends out informational bulletins. He says it's addressed to all members of council. There's nothing wrong with purely informational bulletins. How, how else would you sometimes communicate quickly and decisively, clearly to all members of council, but through information? However, please don't start chiming in on those and start having a discussion that's out of eyesight of the general populace, right? Because that may be an illegal meeting, okay? There's been many cases on electronic transmissions. So the purpose of Section 238, it needs to be interpreted in light of the legislative intent, which is to increase accountability, transparency, and public confidence in the integrity of local government decision-making, right? That's what the case has said. That's what I quoted to you from RSJ Holdings in London and Montour and Branford, right? So members should not be emailing, texting, chatting, messaging, and having serial phone messages with more than a quorum of members of council. Just think about it. You could be starting an illegal meeting by sending an information bulletin, which you could possibly have labeled information purposes only. Please do not reply all. You still could be starting an illegal meeting. So just please bear that in mind when you're looking at this. I'm not at all trying to stop you from 
sending out information only bulletins but if you start interacting and having a discourse it's like you getting together in a closed meeting but it hasn't been properly called there's no one there i.e the clerk who has to be there to take notes and to keep minutes of this right so that's why it could be an illegal meeting so i'm now going to pivot and talk about closed meetings so i've talked about open meetings now i'm going to talk about closed meetings a meeting can be closed to the public if an exception applies. And as I read to you, inherent in the open meeting rule is that, except that's provided in this section. The Act itself recognizes a number of limited exceptions to the open meeting rule, which is based on the subject matter that a council, a local board, or a committee of either of them may consider. There are 14 specific exemptions in subsections 239, 2, 3, and 3.1. <clears throat> the exceptions under section uh, subsections 2 and 3.1 are discretionary. This is a mistake that many people make. They believe that the open meeting exceptions are mandatory, and they're not. Only the ones under sub 3 are, and I will show them to you in just a moment. All of the other ones are discretionary. However, here's my, here's my, uh, my, my editorial. You may at some point during your term of council be urged by members of the public to not have closed meetings, to argue that every meeting of council must be open to the public for a full accountability, full transparency, full uh, integrity, okay? That is hogwash. That's not true, and that's completely wrong. The province has seen fit to craft 14 exceptions. 12 of which are discretionary. And you are permitted to go in camera. And there are very, very good reasons to go in camera in a closed session to discuss certain business at certain times. Now, I'm not saying that every time a subject matter falls within the scope of a possible closed meeting exception that you have to go in camera. But I'm saying to you, sometimes... It's in the public interest that you do so. So don't adhere to all of those laments that you have to do everything in an open public session. That's wrong. And you shouldn't be hold to that standard, okay? Because there are very significant reasons why you should be enclosed on certain matters. And I'll highlight a few of them. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is when you see a general rule in a statute and then you see exceptions, in general, the interpretation to be placed on the general rule is one of broad scope, uh, wide latitude, okay? When you have an exception, typically the exceptions are looked at narrowly and restrictively, and that's how they're applied. And this is no different than the exceptions under the closed meeting exceptions rule in the Municipal Act, okay? Except in one case where it's, the courts seem to have uh, interpreted labor relations very, very broadly, more so than I would have ever thought. So I'm gonna show you the exceptions and then I'll talk about just a few of them. But here are the exceptions under two, sub two, of 239, and these are discretionary, okay? I'm just going to show them quickly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ramp back up to them. Here are the next four, okay? These have been in place since 1994. The amendments to the Municipal Act in 2018 significantly changed the exceptions. It left these first ones in, but added another four. And here are the new exceptions. Notice that following the, uh, the quote of the subsection of the clause, I put in square brackets the section number from MFIPA because each of the new exceptions that was added to the closed meeting exceptions uh, derived from a non-disclosure exception 
under the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. It was the attempt of the legislature to align what council could discuss in camera and what would be protected from disclosure uh, under MFIPA. And I think this is a really good thing. So here are the first two. So you have governmental information that's provided to you in confidence. You have the third-party information that comes from Section 10 of MFIPA. Then you have uh, uh, information that a municipality may be able to monetize. So it's it's the inf it's the inverse of third-party information. It's municipal information that uh, might be scientific, technical, commercial, or financial in nature. And then the final one, which is a position plan, procedure criteria, or instruction that you will use and implement in negotiations that are going underway or to be uh, or uh, that are currently being carried on or to be taken um, in the in the future. These are all things that MFIPA had much earlier recognized and that the Municipal Act was very, very slow to glom onto. I think these are all excellent additional uh, exceptions that were added to the Municipal Act to give you more scope to be able to go in camera. All of these exceptions are discretionary, okay? I wanna talk about, and I won't have time today, but I'll leave you with the slide deck, and I will provide you with my paper. My uh, my next uh, number of slides will look at each of the exceptions, and we'll dig down deeper into it. I won't have time today to go through them all, but I will go through a few of them to help you to understand how these exceptions work. Because sometimes you look at them and you don't understand why they're there. I'm hoping some of these slides and my paper will help explain this. So the first one, security of the property of the municipality. Property is writ large. It doesn't just mean real property, which is the way that the Information and Privacy Commissioner originally interpreted it. And I can't believe that they did that. Because if you look at the Municipal Act, when the Municipal Act means to say real property, it uses the word, surprise, surprise, real property. When it wants to use personal property, it uses those words. When it says property, it means real property, personal property, but it can also mean intellectual property. So it could be like the official mark, trademarks, copyright that the municipality may own. Security means the protection of this, okay? That's what this was intended to provide, to protect property of the municipality, okay? One that you'll see quite often, personal matters about an identifiable individual. The purpose of this exception is to protect individual privacy, okay? Now, people often say to me, hold on, the word means it's personal. It's not personnel. That's right. Many people think this is a human resources type of exception. It's not. It doesn't say personnel matters. It says personal matters. And interestingly enough, it doesn't say personal information, which is a defined term under MFIPA. Personal information means certain specific information that would identify the individuality of a person. Personal matters, in my opinion, means something broader than just personal information. Several years ago, I investigated a, a mayor uh, of a municipality for defrauding the municipality, uh, had expensed uh, claims that he ought not to have expensed, and I had to review this. And if you look under MFIPA, any time that there's an allegation of wrongdoing by an employee or an actor in the municipal context, in the institutional context, that information becomes personal and isn't to be disclosed. So we had this conundrum where a mayor, a publicly elected figure, was defrauding the municipality, a public institution of taxpayer money, public funds, and they had asked me to do the investigation and to write a report. The question became, that can't be released? And at first glance, if you looked at MFIPA, you couldn't. However, 
Section 16 of MFIPA has a public interest override. So for the reasons that I just mentioned to you, public person, public official, public funds, public funds expended to conduct the investigation, all of those reasons demonstrated there was a compelling public interest to release the information. So, but just so you know, a personal matter, in my view, seems to be broader than um, personal information. I think that was deliberate by the province. So if you have an identifiable individual, it's a good reason to go in camera. So again, you have the public saying, we want to know all about this matter. And you have to always do everything in an open public setting. So what happens if you have an allegation potentially against uh, a member of council or potentially a, a senior member of staff that's, uh, you know, pretty controversial? Do you want to have those initial discussions in an open public forum? What if the information is wrong? What if someone has filed a complaint and is completely off base and has fabricated evidence? Uh, we all know about the Taylor Swift deep fake stuff, right? I mean, it's so easy now to create fraudulent type of evidence. Do you want to have those discussions in an open public forum and then be possibly subject to defamation claims? One good reason that you might want to talk about personal matters about an identifiable individual in camera is just that. So another reason. Thirdly, uh, I'll skip through that. You can always have that. Acquisition or disposition of land. Okay. The purpose of the exception is, like a number of other things in here, to protect the municipality's bargaining power. The municipality, in order to take advantage of this exception, must be the prospective buyer or the seller, the vendor of the land. Land applies to more than just the freehold land. It could include easements, uh, licenses, uh, leases. It's not just freehold land okay the purpose of the exception again is to protect the municipality's bargaining power okay so i'm often asked who can attend a closed meeting and i typically say and i'll have a slide later that says you can have pretty much anybody that council would like to have first of all all of council is invited unless you're disqualified from being invited. And we just talked about that in the last session, which was a closed meeting where you have a pecuniary. You're, you're not invited. You can't attend. But council typically can attend. Who else? You have to have the clerk there or someone who has been delegated by the clerk to be able to take uh, notes and record the meeting. Who else? Well, Senior staff, typically, and count, it's at council's discretion, typically. And can you have someone else? You can have third parties. There's nothing wrong with that. However, what if here you were selling land and you had the owner who was purchasing land or the, the proposed uh, owner, the purchaser, in the meeting with you and you're negotiating? Yeah, can't do that in a closed meeting. Why? Because the exception is there to protect your bargaining power. But if you're going to be negotiating with the purchaser or it's vice versa, you're buying and you're negotiating with the vendor, you've lost the ability to protect your bargaining power, right? Now, just think of the silliness of arguing that you always have to have an open public meeting. So the municipality would like to purchase land. And it's found its ideal location. Do you want to go and disclose what that ideal location is prior to you reaching out to the owner of the land? Because why? If they find that out, the purchase price has gone up. You may be able to instruct the real estate agent to make an offer without the person knowing what, what that is. Now, would that be important for that person? person to know? Sure, of course, it would increase their bargaining position. Would it be in the public interest for that one individual or 
persons to know this. Of course not, because you have to safeguard the uh, the um, uh, assets of the municipality. So it would be to your interest to strike a fair bargain, but to get the best bargain that you could uh, at the lowest possible purchase price or the highest possible sale price. And if you have to disclose that in an open public forum, the whole purpose of of uh, your ability to get the best uh, for your constituents would be completely and entirely lost. So I've run through and I've got some slides on some of these for you. I won't be able to go through each and every one of the exceptions because there's just time will not permit. But I'll leave you with the slides. I think there's some really good bullets and slides that will give you a really good understanding, I think, of some of these exceptions and how they work. However, in the paper that I will send to James, uh, there is an article and we'll have it fully cited referring to reports, case law, and uh, a narrative prose so you will you can understand what we're saying. So uh, please forgive me, counsel, but I, I'm not going to go through uh, all of these. You'll see that I've, I've run through each and every one of the uh, exceptions. There is only one that I'd like to mention, and you'll see that all of them all have certain tests and certain criteria that have to be formed. Like, for instance, solicitor-client privilege. In order to have solicitor-client privilege and to be able to rely on this, there has to be three things. Communication between a client and their loyal. A lawyer that somehow relates to the seeking or the giving of legal advice. It doesn't have to entail both. It could be counsel getting together to try to get it, formulate what kind of questions you would like to ask your lawyer, and which is to be considered confidential by the parties. Uh, and as I've said here, it's not necessary for the lawyer to be present at the meeting because solicitor client privilege is not only the advice, but also communications related to that purpose. And if you think just having a lawyer at the meeting will safeguard you, it won't. And we did an investigation in Stratford a couple of years ago where the municipality said, well, the lawyer was in the room and so therefore solicitor client privilege. When we found out why the lawyer was in the room, it wasn't to talk about the subject matter that they said. So the mere presence of a lawyer will not safeguard this uh, exception, okay? Um, uh, here's one that's a little confused sometimes. There may be a closed meeting permitted under another statute, and V will shelter it under this meeting. So the one that I've often come to is Police Services Act. The Police Service Board may meet and have a closed meeting, and it may be on just things that are to avoid disclosure in the public interest, which is very broad, broader than I think some of the exceptions under uh, the Municipal Act. Now, what happens if the Police Service Board Chair would like to come and speak to you, but can't disclose that information? You are allowed to have your closed meeting to hear from the chair of the police service board or a representative of the police service board and be able to shelter that information under clause G of yours because it's sheltered under. Otherwise, you'd be losing the ability or the police service board be losing the ability to have their closed meeting information protected. OK, uh, Confidential information from other levels of government must be applied, must, sorry, must be conveyed explicitly in confidence. This is the one that I'm thankful for. Uh, most of my work is done for municipalities. I very rarely act on the other side. So one of the things that I have to do is bid on procurement matters. And what I want to do is disclose to my potential new client what my rates are, who my team will be, who our references are, who our clients are. That's information that I do not want other people to have, especially my rates. Before this, we weren't able to protect it, even though and FIPA protected this information. So if we supply it in confidence and we can make uh, a case that it would possibly significantly prejudice 
our ability to uh, contract in the marketplace, which it would if our competitors are asking for our uh, RFPs and they get to see what's in the closed meeting, that would be a problem. So this now means that council can discuss those types of things, any RFP submissions, proposals, tenders, things that you don't have to have in a public forum. You can if it protects third party information. This is for the third party. It's not to protect the municipality. This is to protect the third party. Now, the categories are there. I've shown them to you. Here's the corollary, and I mentioned this before. This is the exception for municipal information of monetary value. And you'll see the same categories apply except for labor relations. Why? Because there's a specific closed meeting provision dealing with labor relations, which is the um, the provision that's actually been interpreted quite broadly by the IPC and the courts. And this is the very last discretionary one in subsection two. So when you have positions, plans, procedures to be carried out for negotiations. So there are additional exceptions. These two in 239.3 are mandatory. The first one is if you haven't designated someone to be the head for MFIPA, for FOI requests, it's the municipality. So if if it's the council who is the head, then, and you're considering an MFIPA request, an FOI request, you have to do it in camera. Otherwise, you're disclosing it. The second one is if there's an ongoing investigation by, um, by a certain entity, including a closed meeting investigator, the closed meeting investigator can provide a draft of the report and Council is entitled to have that discussion in a closed meeting. And act actually, not entitled. They're required to have if council's considering it in a closed meeting. There is one more, and that's for educational training purposes. Uh, you may recall last meeting, our training was done under this. Uh, you have, you, you're entitled to do this. Uh, provided that the education and training does not materially advance the business or decision making of the council. Okay, so it says significantly advanced. So that's really advancing it. It's not just the mention of it. So this means you are entitled to increase your knowledge base in a closed meeting that's under education and training, but you can't actually advance the decision making or the business of the council. I'm often asked, well, we're entitled to have workshops off site, right? Where the public's not invited. And the answer is not really. If you're gonna be talking about council business or you're somehow going to be talking about something that's within the realm of decision-making, like let's create our strategic plan. I'm sorry, you're probably significantly advancing those matters you can't do it under under the uh, education and training. You just can't do it. Okay. And here's the case: uh, City of Oshawa. There are uh, while there are an infinite number of topics that could potentially form the subject of an education session. It must be clear that the purpose of such a meeting relates to education only. The municipality cannot circumvent the open meeting rule by characterizing a subject normally considered in open session as being educational, you know, in quotes. So just bear that in mind. The one thing that I wanted to mention is, and I've seen this very recently in a closed meeting investigation that we did, is what happens when you're discussing something in camera and that something is a closed meeting matter, but you slightly deviate, but it's still related to that. There's great uh, insight from the Ontario Divisional Court in the St. Catharines decision from about 14 years ago. The court said when the matters, the closed meeting matter, and potentially some open meeting things are inextricably connected, it would not make sense 
to parse out some of those things and to toggle back and forth and go, uh oh, we've just moved away from some of the closed meeting stuff. We now have to go back in open. Oh, let's adjourn the closed meeting. Let's go back in open. Then you're in open. Oh, we got to discuss the closed meeting stuff again. Now we got to go back in, pass a resolution. The court cases say, and I think this is very helpful. You can't put this artificial toggling in back and forth. It is permissible if the matters are inextricably linked, connected, that you can continue the discussion, even though some of it may slightly veer off the very main subject matter. Now, what you can't do is think about this. You're in camera to discuss a litigation matter, and it's clear, discernible, you're talking about the litigation matter. And a member of council says, whoa, 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 hold on, everybody. Just hold your horses for a second. We have this other litigation, and if we make the decision in this case, it might set a precedent for that other matter over there. And all of a sudden, the discussion moves from the original matter, which was properly under discussion, to maybe this related litigation matter and what to do with that. That would mean to me to be something veering off course, and that's when the clerk or the CEO would try to chime in. Uh, Mayor, members of council, I want to remind you, we're in camera to discuss this item. I think the discussion seems to be migrating to a new course, and, you know, we can't do that. So if it's related closely enough, though, you may be able to do that. And again, your, your CAO, your clerk are there to help you with these things. But I wanted to mention this because this is a question I often get asked. Geez, we veered off course a little bit. Was that okay? And the typical answer is, yeah, it was okay. It was, you know, you just, you didn't bring up a new question, new topic, new issue. So a little bit about procedures and voting. Before going into a closed meeting, you have to have a resolution. You just have to have it. It's mandatory. There has to be an accounting. People need to know that you're going into a closed session. So you have to do that. The authorizing resolution has to provide a general description with as much information as possible without actually giving away the very fact of the closed meeting. So going back to my earlier example where I was talking about Ms. Kelly would like to purchase a prime piece of land. Well, if you have um, uh, uh, a matter and you say we're going in camera to discuss the potential purchase of 123 Main Street to develop the new cultural center in the municipality, well, you've kind of given it away and that's a problem. So you have to bring some reasonableness to this. Yes, the law says you are to disclose as much as possible, but just bear in mind that there's a real reason why you're going in camera, and you may not want to disclose too much, but what you really shouldn't be doing is just reciting the closed meeting exception. We are going into closed session to discuss a personal matter about an identifiable individual. OK, that's just reiterating the words there. Now, in some cases, that may be all you can say, but typically you are able to disclose a little bit more. And that's what the law should require you to do. You are entitled to vote. There's very limited voting. Voting may occur in a closed meeting if both of the following requirements are found. One, you're properly in camera for a closed meeting exception. So you're in camera to talk about one of the 14 things that you can talk about, okay? And two, the vote is either for a procedural matter or for giving directions or instructions to officers, employees, agents, consultants, lawyers of the municipality. Now, I think many closed meeting investigators have made the mistake and they've made an illogical interpretation of vote for procedural matter. And they've made this decision. And I'll tell you, my view is entirely wrong. It says you can vote for a procedural matter. It doesn't say you can vote for a substantive matter. But the logic of saying you can vote for a procedural matter does not automatically say 
and equate to you cannot vote for a substantive matter. Okay? Here's why I say this. Will you make substantive decisions in a closed meeting? Ah, uh, that's a rhetorical question. Yeah, of course you will. Your CAO comes to you. The municipality's involved in a lawsuit. It's controversial. There's an offer to settle. It's a great offer to settle, and you hear from your CAO who's giving you really proactive, expert, knowledgeable advice, giving you his recommendation. Counsel, I think you should accept this offer for these reasons, okay? Now, you can give directions or instructions to officers and employees, right? But before you do that, Let's say you want to give direction to your CAO to settle the matter for what your CAO is recommending. Are you making a substantive decision? Again, a rhetorical question, of course you are. There's, of course you are. You're saying to settle it for $10,000, $100,000, $20,000, whatever it is. You're making a substantive decision. So it's wrong. I can't believe how many closed meeting investigators seem to get this wrong. And they say, you can only vote for a procedural matter. You can't make a substantive decision. Well, in order to determine if you're going to give instructions to somebody to settle litigation, to purchase property, to negotiate to a certain cost of living amount, then you're making a substantive decision. It uh, has to be couched in directions or instructions to, to staff, okay? You can't just say, we've made a decision to settle this. You have to give directions to, to staff or to employees or officers, okay? But you can make substantive decisions. So please don't be misled by someone else saying something different. The effect of improper vote. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to, with all due respect, I'm going to disagree with the Ontario Court of Appeal here. The Ontario Court of Appeals has said the failure to pass the necessary resolutions and unauthorized vote are at most procedural irregularities unconnected with the real decision to pass the bylaw. They do not taint its, illegal, its legality. That's what the court said in this particular case. I think its decision was made on the specific basis of what happened in this case because council made this decision in an in-camera decided to name the square after a well-known former mayor of the city of kingston and they did so in a closed session but they immediately went out and had another vote in an open session where they just did the exact same thing and i think what the court was influenced by was the effect of the open vote by saying, well, they did come out and they did have the vote in public. I think that's wrong. And I don't think it's just uh, a procedural irregularity. To me, it does taint its legality. And I find this case maybe not wrong based on its facts, but its facts are skewed in a certain way. And I, I'm just, I find this uh, sort of, um, I, I'm always of mixed feelings. I feel like I have to tell my clients that that's what the case says, but I also feel I need to editorialize. So please forgive me for that. Attendance and record keeping. I've spoken about this a little bit. I just wanna emphasize this again. Who can attend the closed meeting? All members of council, all members of the local board or their committees may attend except any members who have declared pecuniary interest and are otherwise disqualified at law from attending, whether through bias, disqualifying bias, conflict of interest, not under the Conflict of Interest Act. The clerk must attend or a person been designated in writing by the clerk or uh, an officer may attend to take notes and, and minutes. My comment is any other staff, agents or other persons, including external third parties, may attend a closed meeting at the discretion and the will of counsel, provided that the attendance of these other persons 
does not derogate from and erode the very purpose for which the exemption uh, exemption is there. For instance, my ex my example to you of the vendor or the or the purchaser in a case where the council is buying or selling lands. Okay, so. You can have anyone that you want, and I think it's a mistake to put in your procedure bylaw who must attend, because I had one situation where the municipality was wanting to talk about the termination of its senior executive officer, senior administrative officer, and their procedure bylaw said the senior executive officer must attend all meetings. So council would have had to pass a bylaw to waive the rules, which it could only do in that case with a three quarters vote. So that was a bit of a problem. So I would say maybe not a good idea to put those sorts of terms who must attend in your uh, procedure bylaw because it may be tying your hands. <laughs> Record keeping. Uh, Record has to be kept without note or comment. I won't talk about this too much further. Um, audio video recording. Uh, years ago, when the ombudsman first became the closed meeting investigator, asked us for an opinion. Uh, should councils audio or video record their meetings? The ombudsman wanted us to come back and say, absolutely yes, because then it would be much easier to conduct a closed meeting investigation. My partner, Jody Johnson, and I actually went back and said, actually, what is the purpose of having a closed meeting? Council, the purpose of having a closed meeting is to discuss matters in a full and frank way between members of council out of the public realm when they're permitted. It's not to put a chill on them and to go, oh, geez, this might be used against me at some point. So we said, we don't think that that is a good idea. Many councils have imported this. Now that I am a closed meeting investigator, I certainly see the utility of audio or video recording your meetings, but I just question whether it uh, somehow erodes the uh, or puts a chill on the full and frank discussion that council has. Uh, I, I'm, I'm now sort of on the fence. If council wants to have it, I just say, I'm not going to argue against you. And it is easier for a closed meeting investigator to be able to see a video recording of what's happened in a closed meeting. Uh, but is that the purpose of the closed meeting? No, it's not to keep the record there. It's to have the discussion, the deliberations. So what should be in a closed meeting record? I won't go through this. I'll just leave it on the slide for you. The Ontario Ombudsman has a good closed meeting uh, investigation uh, of closed meeting booklet or an open meeting booklet, which has this in there. Um, closed meeting investigations, just very quickly, any person may request the investigation. Notice that it doesn't say elector or a person demonstrably acting in a public interest. It says a person. The reason I think this is there is because you will do business with people who aren't electors in the municipality. Maybe those people should have a right to know if there was an improper closed meeting. The jurisdiction of the closed meeting investigator is very narrow. A person may request an investigation of whether a council has complied with section 239 or procedure bylaw and who can who, who can undertake this uh, an investigator so someone who you have chosen or if you haven't chosen a closed meeting investigator which by the way your municipality has and thank you very much it's by default the ontario ombudsman the investigation is not to look at anything else. It's not to look, did council act in bad faith? Did council say something that was defamatory? Those are not questions that we look at as closed meeting investigators. We just look at, was the meeting conducted in accordance with the requirements of the procedure bylaw or section 239? That's all we look at, okay? Um, we have certain requirements uh, in order to conduct. We carry out our investigations independently with impartiality. So we're not beholden to do just what council wants us to do or report back the way staff would like us to report back. We have independence. We have to do it confidentially and we have to attempt to bring some credibility to it. So if uh, we bring forward any reports, we will have a full investigative report 
The investigations are conducted in private. We are entitled to get information from anyone we want. And if we don't, we are entitled to compel people by summons because we have the powers of the Ontario Ombudsman under Section 19, which says that we can summon someone to bring forward evidence and to give us uh, uh, responses to questions. Uh, the duty of confidentiality overrides the provisions of MFIPA. Uh, there is no ability to bring a judicial review of an, a closed meeting investigation. The only question that there can be is whether the um, closed meeting investigator had jurisdiction to do this. So just today, I dismissed on a summary basis a closed meeting investigation request because the person came forward and made a number of allegations that council did a whole bunch of things wrong, but not any of them were procedural, i.e. under the procedure bylaw or contravene section 239. So I had to consider what is my jurisdiction here? My jurisdiction is not to find out whether council may have done something wrong as council, it's whether they procedurally went into uh, a closed meeting for a proper subject matter, passed the proper resolution, didn't take in proper votes, and kept the proper records. That's what I'm looking at. I tried to explain this, and I bet there's going to be a complaint uh, attempted to be filed against me because I didn't proceed with the investigation. But I think the investigation, I had no jurisdiction. By the way, I don't think the person can make a complaint because uh, there is no body to make a complaint to. The only thing they could do is bring a judicial review to the courts, and I'm not sure that uh, the person wants to actually do that. What are the steps of a, a closed meeting investigation? There has to be a formal request by a complainant or or uh, a requester, however you want to call them. The person remains anonymous. The initial intake will review and consider, do we have jurisdiction? And is this an actual closed meeting investigation request? Or is it something else? Are you complaining about a privacy breach? Because the IPC looks after that under MFIPA. Are you complaining about uh, bad faith? Well, that's a court application under Section 273 of the Municipal Act. So we will consider that. We will notify the municipality uh, in writing of the request. Typically, the request, though, does come through the clerk's department, which is, which is interesting, so they'll be aware of it. We then conduct a field investigation. We'll try to gather all of the materials. We'll often ask the clerk, can you provide these things? A uh, certified copy of your procedure bylaw, who was at the meeting, your notes of the meeting, even if it's, you know, closed meeting, Yes, we need to see the confidential notes. Do you have any other notes? So we ask those sorts of things. We then make a determination of findings and we prepare a draft report, which we provide typically back to the clerk. The clerk then makes a decision. The clerk does not have to take it to council. It all depends on the municipality. Some municipalities, the clerk will take it to council and council can only consider it in a closed meeting. We then deliver the final report and that really depends on what we do. Sometimes we feel we have to present the report because council's acted wrongly and appropriately. And sometimes we write a report, we find no contravention, but Perhaps the requester has gone and told people in the media, has told a whole bunch of people, has posted it on social media. Sometimes there is a reason why we would like to write a report and have a public report to say to council, you didn't do anything wrong. And we have done that in certain instances. Um, if a contravention of the open meeting rule is reported, council is required to pass a resolution as to how it will address the report. So if we write back and say the council, the municipality doesn't have an adequate protocol for how to deal with confidentiality in a closed meeting, and we report that, council has to pass a resolution indicating how they're gonna deal with that. So for instance, retain a consultant, uh, request the clerk to provide a report and a new policy, a uh, new protocol, uh, something like that. Um, and the report must be made available to the public. That's for uh, all, uh, shedding a spotlight on this. Uh, and there it is, uh, that 
uh, report and recommendations. Unlike a closed, uh, sorry, unlike a code of conduct uh, investigation report, there are no sanctions or penalties that may be imposed. We as closed meeting investigators may make recommendations, but they're not of a punitive nature. They are, they should be remedial, meaning that they seek to repair, rectify uh, any, um, any, um, um, anything that's not appropriate or to prevent something uh, going wrong in the future. Okay, so there's no uh, uh, penalties in that sense. The report has to be made public and, as I said, council has to pass a resolution. Okay, reporting. There is no statutory requirement that says that you have to report out or that you have to do so in a certain way. So there's no bright line test here. Councils have adopted certain customs, traditions in how they report out. The Ontario Ombudsman has said there should be as much reporting out as possible without taking away from the very purpose why it was done in an in-camera setting. But you should attempt to report out as much as possible. Why? for reasons of accountability, transparency, and openness. But again, there's no legislative requirement, and I can't point you to another municipality to say, this is what you have to do every time because this is what they do. They do something because that's the process and the custom, the tradition that they've adopted in their municipality. The only stricture here is to try to report out as much as possible. Uh, you can approve the notes, the record of the closed session, the minutes, if you will, in closed session. You are allowed to do that. You can go under the heading of the original uh, subject matter in which to do so. Because sometimes to discuss it in an open public forum might mean that you might be divulging something that's confidential. So you don't have to do that. You can do it in a closed session. So my conclusions, Madam Mayor and members of council, are that um, uh, some common problems. One, council goes in, in camera where there's no closed meeting exception that applies. Two, they identify the wrong closed meeting exception. They go in to talk about A, but really they've said that D was the closed meeting exception, right? Sometimes that's a real problem. Sometimes it isn't. OK, there is a failure to comp uh, apply with the procedural requirements, uh, i.e. you haven't passed the proper resolution. Uh, sometimes that's forgotten. Council just decides in the rush we're going to go in camera and doesn't pass the resolution. You have to pass the resolution before you have an improper vote. You make a substantive decision, but it's not in a way that you're giving direction. You make a decision, and that's, that's wrong. Uh, or you vote for something else. Uh, there's improper and sufficient record keeping. You don't report out fully. And education and training is not the sole only purpose of the meeting. You somehow deviate. You go in to talk about education and training, but all of a sudden you're giving substantive advice and you're making substantive decisions. You can't do that. Best practices, try to provide notice of upcoming closed meetings if you can, I fully appreciate the requirement under the act is before going into the closed meeting, you have to pass a resolution that can happen ad hoc. And if you're asking me, is that wrong? No, sometimes something comes up the day of or you're talking about a matter and all of a sudden in discussing a matter that's properly and open, you might all of a sudden be talking about something that's closed meeting information. So you might have to pass a resolution, say we need to go in camera, and that might be appropriate, right? However, if you can give notice, that's great. And if you know ahead of time when the agenda is made that you're going to be going potentially in camera on certain things, staff will recommend this. Uh, that doesn't mean the council has to, but it means that there's probably a good reason why staff is recommending and you should at least uh, hear them out on it. Pass a clear resolution as to why you're going in, select the correct closed meeting exceptions. And yes, you can have more than one. There's no problem with having multiple exceptions. I would urge against citing all of them though, because that's probably not the case. Don't try the, uh, let's see what sticks. Pick the correct ones. 
when you're enclosed, stick to the subject matter and try not to deviate. Many times, if you're with a solicitor, you're with the clerk, you're with the CAO, the treasurer, they will try to steer you back on course. It's their job. Don't get mad at them if they do that. They're trying to protect you. Keep a record of the closed meeting, report out as much as possible. And my final one is not really captured in here. It's captured in the original uh, first uh, session that I did with you on code of conduct. You have to have codes of conduct that address confidential information. One of the sources of confidential information is closed meeting information. It is a cardinal rule that what is said in a closed meeting, what is discussed, what is disclosed in a closed meeting stays in the closed meeting. It's confidential, okay? Never, ever disclose what's happened in a closed meeting unless two things. One, council has agreed to it. Council has waived the disclosure. It's like council waiving privilege. If council says, we discussed this in camera. We're okay with this. Council can report out to its to the extent that it wants, and it can make everything public if it wants. So council can waive that. Two, and this will happen in very limited circumstances. Something may happen at a closed meeting where a council member, or more than one, feels that they may have personal liability. Come and ask us as integrity commissioner whether there is a matter. You are entitled to disclose confidential closed meeting information to us for the purposes of getting our advice. So here's one example. A council member called me and, and said, John, I was at a closed meeting yesterday. I have some real concerns. There were third parties in the closed meeting. And while it was a closed meeting, I feel I was defamed. I feel a council member defamed me. But I'm not a lawyer, and I might need to disclose this. Can I do so? And I said to him, first of all, the information that you're giving me is confidential. I'm under a cone of silence under Section 223.5 of the municipal act. So this is confidential. It won't go anywhere. And I said to him, you may need to disclose this, and tell me what you want to disclose Show me what you want to do, because you're not going to disclose everything that was at the meeting. But you, we may need to disclose just a little bit more of maybe just the offending statement, because as you know, uh, defamation is not just one statement, one word. It's the context in which it was done. I need to know that. And so in that case, one other exception, again, you can ask the, the, uh, the, uh, close, uh, the IC, there are cases that have said that if a council member has breached the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, by being at a closed meeting, that's allowed to be disclosed by a council member who would like to bring that to the attention of someone. Because the courts have said, but for a member who's at the meeting or staff member disclosing that, no one would be the wiser that a member attended a closed meeting when they weren't supposed to, if they had a pecuniary interest. So those are a couple of exceptions. Otherwise, never, ever disclose closed meeting information. Remember, it belongs to council, not to any individual council member who doesn't have executive or ministerial authority to make decisions on behalf of council. So only council can do that. So, Madam Mayor, I've come to the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen. And um, I'd be pleased to take any questions that council may have. Thank you. I'll look to council then. Questions on the second half? I don't see any hands or questions. And I think you've already indicated you're going to send us some more reading materials so that will reinforce some of the uh, content that you've already included here, I think, and broaden this detail. Well, if there isn't anything, um, I find this time really well spent. It's, it's really useful to have a refresher and learn the new pieces and the concrete examples that you give sort of puts it in the mind in a certain way. So um, on behalf of council, I'd really like to say thank you very much for all the effort. And 
the enthusiasm with which you yes. Yeah, I mean, potentially this could be a really long lecture. <laughs> Think, well, um, yeah, your experiences and everything you bring to the table really help us um, understand. And we appreciate your um, encouragement to reach out too. I think that's really good, something good to know. So thank you again. And until next time, uh, we'll, we'll bundle along and we'll make sure that we remember you if we need it. Thank you. All right. Ma Madam Mayor, members of council, thank you very much. This is very kind and generous of you, the time that you've given me to speak to you. I, I, I thank you for your patience, for listening to me. And I really, really want to do a shout out to both your CAO, Michael, and your, your clerk, James, who were very embracing of my asking of, you know, can we do some training? And so I really do want to thank them for bringing it forward and for, for council. So thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll let you go. And thank you again for the... Uh, for uh, listening uh, on this. I really very much appreciate it. So have a good rest of the meeting. Thank you. Until next time then. Okay. Okay. Now we do have to um, take care of business here. We have a, move, a motion before us. The council received this presentation regarding this uh, conflict of interest act as well as the open and closed meeting um, information. I need it. Okay. I see Councilor Burrs and Councilor Kates. All in favor? And that is carried. And we also have one bylaw. Uh, we do that. Yeah, yeah just okay. Yeah, so just uh, bylaw. Yeah. So there's the one under uh, six point one 2024, number thirteen being a bylaw to um, adopt and confirm all the actions and proceedings of council of the Missoula Middlesex Center at the special council meeting held on this date. Uh, that is meeting A. Uh, mover and a seconder, please. Councilor Arts, Councilor Shipley, all in favor. And that is carried as well. So now we need to adjourn this meeting at 4.59. If I could have a motion, please. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan and Council Huffington, thank you. All in favor? And that is everything until we have half an hour until the next meeting. So we stand adjourned until then.